I will go ahead and call this meeting to order and we will begin this evening by having our clerk, Nicole Bolden, please call the roll. Hello everyone. If I have council member Rosenbarger. Sims. Here. Volan. Here. Scambolari. Here. Sandberg. Here. Rallo. Here. Flaherty. Here. Smith. Here. And Piedmont Smith. Here. And I'm going to circle back around to Councilmember Rosenbarger. Here. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Summarizing tonight's agenda for Wednesday, March the 2nd, uh, we have no minutes to approve. We will have reports from council members followed by reports from the mayor and city offices. And we do have two reports this evening on the LEAF program and review of historic and conservation district guidelines. Uh, council committees followed by the first opportunity for public comment. We will have plenty of appointments to boards and commissions this evening, and that will be followed by legislation for second readings and resolutions. Resolution 22-07 to approve recommendations of the mayor for distribution of community development block grant funds for 2022, followed by resolution 22-06 to confirm resolution 22-05 designating an economic revitalization area, approving the statement of benefits and authorizing an abatement period for recording in progress and personal property regarding properties at 1300 South Patterson Drive, Catalan, Indiana, LLC petitioner. There is no legislation for first readings this evening, so we will have a second opportunity for public comment, uh, followed by a discussion of our council schedule, and then we will adjourn for this evening. So let us go to the top of our meeting agenda here and start with any reports from council members. And I will begin as I see you on my screen, council member Scambolori. Any reports this evening? Sorry, I'm never first, so I got thrown. Um, yes, thank you. I want to extend an invitation to my March constituent meeting coming up this Friday, or excuse me, this Saturday, March 5th at 1.30 p.m. Um, we may be back in person in the coming months, but for now we'll stay on Zoom. The link is at sue4citycouncil.com. There's a join button on uh, the opening page and just click on that and you'll be transported to the meeting. Um, we have a special guest this week, uh, Chief Jason Moore of the Bloomington Fire Department will be with us, um, but certainly any number of topics or ideas are most welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Sims, do you have a report this evening? No report, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rallo. Thank you. Um, well, on a very large topic, I'm sure we've all been watching what's been unfolding in Central Europe, the war in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, clearly, this is an illegal preemptive war, should be condemned, should be stopped immediately. Uh, and I support uh, the Ukrainian people uh, to that end. Uh, however, I think we also need to be aware that matters could get uh, escalated even further. And this council adopted a resolution last September for the abolition of nuclear weapons. Uh, unfortunately, that is far in the distant future. There are uh, some 10,000 nuclear weapons, mostly uh, in the arsenals of Russia and the United States. So, this is alarming because we could imagine matters escalating in Ukraine. There are many pathways that escalation could, uh, could occur, um, importing arms or uh, a fly zone, as some people, I've seen some pundits actually advocate, which would put us into a direct conflict between NATO and Russia. Um, this can't occur because it's very far too dangerous. So I'm stating this tonight because I think it's imperative that citizens 
contact their representatives to make sure that this doesn't occur. Um, it, it is going to require people to step forward as they did in the 1980s um, to tell the representatives uh, of the danger that exists in going this route and that the best avenue to resolve this is through diplomacy and through negotiation. Um, that's what we ought to be doing. Be very firm in insisting Russia pull out immediately, cease hostilities, but also uh, compel our representatives to use diplomacy. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Piedmont Smith. I don't have a report this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Smith. I'll echo what uh, Council Member Rallo said that uh, it's a terrible situation uh, with Ukraine and uh, I stand with Ukraine and, and uh, all the folks over there who are, are suffering under this uh, uh, illegal attack. And uh, so hopefully we'll get through this uh, as well as we can. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Flaherty. I report this evening. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Bolin. Yes. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge the complaint of a constituent of mine on uh, 14th Street who has written to express his dismay over the construction of the new apartment building uh, between the tracks and 14th Street. He lives immediately adjacent to them. And uh, he says that uh, his roommates were very busy and he uh, are being uh, woken up at 7 a.m. due to loud drilling, dump trucks, dumping materials and reversing and uh, the cleaning of the road that is next to my house as causing them to not get any sleep and is directly affecting their well-being and their academics. Um, and I'll just point out that uh, while I believe that the construction is within their right to, uh, to start that early, uh, perhaps we should be rethinking that rule. Uh, I don't think it's reasonable for anyone to be woken up at 7 a.m. for any reason. Uh, for continued construction noise. Um, my understanding from another constituent also was that the worst part of the noise seems to happen at the very beginning of the day. And so I wanna question this practice, but I wanted to uh, underscore this complaint um, as uh, one that we should be you know, reconsidering uh, in light of the obvious disturbance that it represents. Um, you know, we are considering on a regular basis uh, uh, the development and growth of Bloomington, which in includes the construction of buildings. We're going to be thinking about one of those tonight. Um, you know, uh, be being sensitive to its uh, effect on uh, neighborhoods, uh, regardless of who lives in them, I think is something that every member of this council is concerned about. So uh, I want to express my, uh, uh, my concern on behalf of this constituent. And I hope that there's something that we can uh, do uh, to speak with the, uh, the builders to ask them to relent somewhat. Anyway, that's a small brief report for now. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rosenberger. Hi, yes, thank you. I just wanted to remind everyone that my next constituent meeting is Tuesday, March 8th. So I am uh, second Tuesday of the month this year, and they are at 5.30. That link can be found on our um, webpage. This month, we are um, hosting the Rose Hill Farm Stop. So they are a new business in, the, in, in District 1, and they are really focused on uh, food access and improving our regional food system. So excited to hear from them. Thank you. Thank you. And just to wrap up, I would like to uh, acknowledge the fact that the Waldron Art Center will be reopening. There will be a uh, ceremony this Friday. I do believe that is from five o'clock until eight. There'll be some exciting announcements made about ongoing activities in that arts center and who the uh, potential managers of that facility will be going forward. So um, that is certainly an event on my calendar. I'm very eager um, to see more um, arts commence in the Waldron Arts Center in our downtown arts district. 
And so um, exciting, exciting to see that news pop um, on my social media feeds today. Um, the next up on our agenda are two reports from the mayor and city offices. We may want to have a motion to extend the time uh, as we have a report from the LEAF program, which I believe may take about 20 minutes. And then we have a review of historic and conservation district guidelines, which may take an additional time. But let us go ahead and get started here with the uh, LEAF program report. And with us here this evening is Ms. Dave DeKid. Thank you, President Sandberg. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you to the mayor and the council for giving us the opportunity to present the recommendations resulting from this two year innovation effort. We're proud not only of the results from the pilot, but also the way that we engage nearly every city department, thousands of individual residents in transforming a city service to make it better for our residents, our climate and our budget. That's in addition to dozens of community partnerships that participated as well. <clears throat> My name is Dave Takid. I'm the Director of Innovation for the City of Bloomington, and I work out of the Office of the Mayor. With me tonight to tell the story of this effort are uh, Michael Large, the Special Projects Operation Manager for Public Works, Joe Winia, who was a member of the project steering team, as well as nearly every subcommittee associated with the project, Joe's also a member of the City Sustainability Commission and the Citizens Advisory Committee for the Monroe County Solid Waste Management District. Joe does not sleep. Um, also joining us tonight is Assistant Director of Sustainability, Lauren Clemens, who will be on hand to answer any questions that you have related to sustainability. <clears throat> and to start us off, I'll turn it over to Michael Large. We'll give you a little bit of context about the project. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for your time this evening. My name is Michael Large. I am the Special Projects and Operations Manager for the Department of Public Works. Uh, to give you a brief history and background on this pilot program, uh, it all began in February 2020. I, as well as several other members of different departments throughout the city, were part of the original innovation team. Um, Pre-COVID, we were able to meet in person in the mill and begin to brainstorm uh, this issue of leaf collection. Um, the, the primary goal for us was to, to reduce the financial and environmental impacts that the leaf collection program has. Um, speaking with residents initially, we found that they were dissatisfied with the service for a number of reasons. Uh, whether the trucks came too early or they came too late or not knowing where exactly and when they were going to be in their neighborhood, these were all things that we were looking to resolve and find answers to. Um, with the onset of COVID, obviously things changed for us and how we interact with each other as well as the community, but we still overcame those challenges. And for the remainder of 2020, we went out of our way to interview and speak with a number of stakeholders, including staff who were on the leaking crews, residents of the community, um, including other communities who are having similar issues and how they were going about resolving this type of problem with the collection of the leaves. Uh, in the fall of 2020, we went and participated and worked with HAND and two different neighborhoods to collectively get 22 houses on board for the original iteration of the pilot program. Um, we chose to do four different prototypes on managing leaves um, with the one that we really started to focus on and came to mind was the mulching in place uh, that way individuals had a way to manage their own leaves. Um, we asked the 22 households to mulch and compost um, as much as they could of their own leaves that were being produced in their property. Um, with that, the excess would be bagged and collected by our yard waste through the Sanitation Division of Public Works. Um, the, the bags themselves were free and we had very, very good success with this initial program. Um, 22 households, they were a success. Um, of those 22 households, 59% of them or approximately 13 of the 22 households were able to manage all their leaves on site. Um, no city services used, so no bags, no leafing, uh, vacuum trucks. 
But even more so was that a large majority of them were very supportive of this pilot strategy. They liked the input. They liked being able to have their views taken into consideration when it came to that. And the fact of the matter was, was that vacuum was, was not the only option for them to, to manage their leads on a year-to-year -year basis. Um, while 76% supported vacuuming being just one of many options moving forward. All right. So once again, that's just 22 households in a uh, community with approximately 14,000. So what do we do about these different scenarios and situations that others may have? Um, larger yards, uh, properties that are adjacent to parks and greenways where the leaves and the wind would blow. Um, I know myself having been a re being a resident of the city that um, it's always the situation where you, you rake up all your leaves and get them corralled and a windstorm comes along and you find that your neighbor's leaves are now in your yard and it's time to do it all over again. So educating the individuals was, was our big issue here. And we were trying to make them familiar with the idea of composting on site, mulching on site. And we were able to address uh, many of their issues. Uh, in addition to, we were concerned about individuals who maybe had physical challenges. And with that, we were able to collaborate with Helping Hands of Monroe County to offer a, a service that was free of charge to those individuals had they needed it to collect and, and wrangle their leaves for the season. Um, moving forward into 21, we were able to move into a second phase of this pilot program. Building upon the success that we had with the original pilot, we took what we learned and we started to reach out to individuals in the community to address the issues that they had raised. Uh, the program expanded and to incorporate four city uh, departments as well as 13 community partners and two of the county's districts. The expanded pilot program in the end had 493 households that came on board with us, uh, representative of all the council districts. In fact, many of our own including some of you here tonight, were part of this great program. So with that, a multitude of educational components were part of this program. Taking what we had learned from that small talk with 22 households, we were able to develop facts and questions, brochures and pamphlets, online guides, hands-on demonstrations that were on YouTube and videos that they could access at any given time at their convenience, um, the volunteer yard, consultants that would come out and educate individuals about what composting on site really was and how it benefited not only the environment, but the soil quality, as well as their overall involvement in their neighborhoods and areas. Um, while there were no participants in this uh, iteration of the pilot program that, that needed the extra volunteer help, that was still available to them. So what were certain, some incentives to get these people out there and part of this program? We worked directly with uh, Earth Keepers to provide them with uh, monthly composting at a discounted rate. In fact, it was free for the first 40 or so individuals that came on board. We provided them with uh, free leaf bags and other equipment such as this leaf chute that you see on the screen that helped them with the overall process of collecting the leaves um, the, the Monroe County Soil and Water Conservation District offered free soil testing to the first 40 or so uh, participants as well, just so they would know what the baseline um, of their soil composition was moving forward. And more importantly, what everyone loves to have is a prize in the end. So congratulations to Grandview Hills. Um, working with the hand department who has generously donated a, a small grant to the individual uh, neighborhood. They will now be the champion winners and have a block party uh, in the near future that will allow them to celebrate them not putting out any bags of leaves. Um, I, will, I will reiterate that the way in which we chose the winning neighborhood throughout the city was the ones that put out the least amount of bags for collection in the end. So the ones that were able to utilize all that they learned about composting in place and really take it to heart and 
make this entire pilot program a success. Um, in addition, um, the top 10 neighborhoods outside of the, uh, the winter of Grandview Hills also received um, pollinator gardens for their community, for their neighborhoods to be installed in the springtime. So, but what we're really more concerned about as we move forward with this, even though we've had great success is, were we just shifting the workload from the vacuum collection crews of the street division to the yard waste crews of the sanitation division by having them pick up the bag? More importantly, were we increasing CO2 emissions from gas power lawnmowers away from the trucks that pull the vacuum tr trucks around due to all the, mo the mowing and mulching that was now taking place within the city limits? Uh, to explain a little more and dive deeper into what we've found, uh, I will pass it back over to Dave. Thanks, Michael. So how did we do? 201 of the 493 participants completed the end of pilot survey that serves as the basis for a lot of the metrics that I'm gonna be going over tonight. This first metric was really a reality check. Was the challenge too ambitious or is it possible to use mulching and composting as our default leaf management strategy across a variety of yard sizes and configurations? The answer is yes. 91% of the respondents said they were able to mulch, compost, give away, or set out bags of leaves for yard waste collection and not use the vacuum collection at all. Earlier, Michael mentioned that 59% of residents in the 22 household pilot were successful in not using the vacuum service. And I got to tell you, back then, we were thrilled that more than 50% of the participants could do without the vacuum service. And we didn't know if that percent would hold up when we expanded the pilot beyond those two neighborhoods. So seeing a 32% increase when the number of respondents was more than 10 times what that pilot was gave us real confidence in expanding the strategy even more. Not only were participants able to complete the challenge, we have some evidence that the change will stick. Just under 30% of respondents said that they used the vacuum collection system in 2020. Less than half of them said that they would use it in future years. When you compare this statistic with the previous one, what we're hearing is that 91% of respondents can process all of their leaves without using a city service, but really only 87% would do that. In looking at yard waste use, 12.5% of respondents said that they bagged their leaves for collection in 2020. Only a little over 4% of them said that they would set out bags of leaves for collection in future years. Taking all of this together, what this tells us is that providing incentives, a variety of learning opportunities, a supportive learning community, all of this together can help us reduce the demand for both vacuum collection and yard waste bag pickup, which means that we did not, as we had feared, shift the workload from the vacuum crew to the yard waste crew. Our second metric is about the operating costs associated with leaf management. When this project began, we evaluated the data from 2019 and found that the cost to operate the vacuum collection service was coming in close to three quarters of a million dollars per year. Process improvements implemented by our very own Michael Large and the streets division in 2020 reduced the cost primarily associated with labor by nearly $200,000 per year. They did this by starting later in the season and using additional crews to rake ahead of vacuumers, making the vacuuming more efficient. Our question became then, can we do any better than that? And the answer is yes. We can save an additional 206 to $417,000 per year over the improved 2020 operating costs, even if we're conservative in our estimate. Remember that our survey results said that 91% could manage their leaves that way, but only 87% actually would. 
our calculations actually use the figure of only 60% of households managing their leaves this way. Note that the low end of the projected operating costs does assume an eventual revenue from charging a fee for on-demand vacuuming. We're still projecting, um, and even if we don't charge that fee, we're still projecting $200,000 per year cost savings over the 2020 operating costs. So what about environmental impact? Remember that we were worried about shifting CO2 emissions from our diesel leaf vacuum trucks to individual lawn mowers used to mulch leaves. Did we reduce the environmental impact? The answer is yes. An initial analysis of available data by our Assistant Director of Sustainability using an EPA greenhouse gas equivalencies calculator showed that the metric tons of CO2 emissions produced by the percent of households who would use a gas powered mower to mulch their leaves are less than half of the emissions produced by the diesel trucks operating nonstop for three and a half months during leafing season. Given more data, the accuracy of this estimate can be improved in future years. And please note that this estimate does not take into account that the electric mowers used are charged using electricity generated in part from coal and natural gas fired power plants. And now I'll turn it over to Joe to present the participant perspective. Thank you, Deita, and good evening, council members. I am Joseph Winia, and as uh, Director Kidd mentioned, I wear many hats, and this program includes a few of them. Uh, as for the environmental code benefits, I'll mention that in addition to the emissions reductions that Deita described, there are a number of direct environmental code benefits to mulching and composting leaves on site. First, and quite simply, undisturbed leaf mulch provides the necessary coverage that pollinators require for egg laying and overwintering. Second, regularly applying compost and leaf mulch will progressively increase soil's rainwater absorption capacity, which will reduce the total runoff that contributes to water contamination and flooding events, which is particularly with the particularly important with the forecasted um, increase in such events with climate change. Uh, also, leaves play an essential role in the plant and soil nutrient cycle, and keeping them in place provides food for the soil life, which provides nutrients for the plant life which provides more leaves for the next season, and that this initiative helps to restore that cycle. Lastly, leaves provide the carbon-rich organic material necessary to balance kitchen scraps in home food waste composting, and this program provided an excellent opportunity to educate participants on the impacts of food waste and provide them with the means to reduce their impact through effectively composting it on site with the materials provided directly by their own yard. So one aspect of the pilot program that was not anticipated, but was reported by numerous participants was a sense of community building and helpful neighborly engagement. Uh, a few different elements that illustrate this from the participant feedback are that involvement in the program and participation with the city generated a sense of unity and collaboration, that the yard signs became a part of the community conversation, that the Facebook group facilitated the exchange of a significant number of leaves directly between participants and neighbors, and uh, community members came together for consultations and demonstrations. And most importantly, participants just shared their tips and tricks and stories while they were outside with their neighbors uh, who were both participants and non-participants alike. So we really believe that preserving and fostering this teaching and sharing community that was built by the participants is an essential component of making this program a success in the future. Well, here are a few examples of actual survey responses submitted by the participants. Uh, I truly don't think I will ever rake again, except to make small piles for composting in garden beds. This has been a game changer and we are super grateful for all that we have learned. And another says, all these years I've used leaves and organic kitchen waste to compost, sort of. The truth is, I don't know when it's done. I rarely use the compost in the garden. And the consultant took a look at our system and gave me some great information about how to use compost correctly. One half hour was all it took. Great results from the consultant. And lastly, um, you can probably read it faster than I can even say it, but for those who can't see it, I'll just say, it says, I can't wait until next fall to see my soil. And I think that this last one really demonstrates the type of perspective and personal values that we need to have on these basic natural resources 
and that the more members of this community and planet that appreciate these values, the more of a restorative impact and viable future we can have. So with that, I will turn it back over to David to talk about that future. Thanks, Joe. And so Dave, Dave, if I'm if I may just interrupt, we are at our 20 minutes right now. So without further objection from council, can we grant uh, additional time to conclude not only this report from the LEAF program, but also to extend uh, the same courtesy to our next presenter? Any, any objections from council to extend the time? Madam President, do we have time for questions as well? That would be up to the council, I would, I would, I would ask you. Madam Chair. Yes. Um, as per Mr. Rallo, like it, it, we're already at time. If we can just go to questions, uh, I, I don't, I'm a little uh, concerned about going too far over time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dave, do you, the recommendations, are you to the end of your presentation at this point? Yes, I am. Perhaps so if, how, no. Madam President, could Dave yes. to just uh, put the slide up for recommendations and we could read it and then go to questions. Sure. Is that possible? Everybody have an opportunity to, to read the recommendations? Thank you. And at this point, let us see if there are questions from Council to uh, the presenters of the report. Council Member Rallo, and if we can unshare the screen at this point so I can see the, the entire council. And, and again, thank you for the presentation. Very informative. I think we all have a, a very good, uh, you know, good overview of the program. So uh, Council Member Rallo, question? Yes, I, I, I want to first uh, give you all credit. Thank you so much. This is a, a, a wonderful program and I'm, I'm very pleased. Um, I, I was an early advocate for this in 2007 and and now it's finally happening. And I, I wanna credit my colleague, um, Council Member Piedmont Smith, because she's been bringing this up uh, at yearly budgets because it does cost a lot of money. Back in 2007, it was a quarter of a million. And now I'm surprised, not really not surprised. It's, it has been so much in terms of cost and potential savings. Um, I, I just wanted to also add the comment that I think that one potential benefit would be to use utilize leaves for like lasagna bedding or mulching. And that way you could use it in your garden or you could to suppress weeds. Or the other is that you could use it if you have invasives to put cardboard over the invasives and then put leaves on top. But my question is about, um, is it possible, it, is a further reduction in carbon and energy use, could you uh, imagine that people will not need to shred their leaves, that they could simply use them as whole leaves because that's, essentially what I do and seems to work. And um, the only carbon I, I utilize is what I use breaking them, which is, you know. Yes, absolutely. We had some participants who use that strategy and a lot of times that's really an aesthetic question. Um, we've been brought up that our leaves, our, our yard should be raked completely clean. Um, and also sometimes when you've got a thick layer of leaves, then it can encourage moss, which I personally would love to have a yard full of moss so I don't have to mow, but not everybody likes that. Mm, I don't suffer from that at all. <laughs> uh, but that's, that's great. And one last benefit, these are leaves that aren't going into storm drains that are plugging them during rain, rain events. If they're, you know, because we sweep them to the street often and they're not picked up immediately. So thank you again. That's a wonderful report. And I'm so happy that it's being adopted. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions from council for the presenters? Council member Sims. Thank you. Thank you, Depta, for the report um, and everyone else that participated. Um, years ago, I do remember that the city used to provide leaf pick up bags and you went to fire stations to pick them up. Um, so will that be available in the future? Um, I know that they're, you're talking about a, a, an additional cost for the vacuum um, to, to the folks, but will the city, is there part of the plan to provide free leaf pickup bags as we did in the past? And is that a, will that incentivize part of the program? Yes, so um, 
what we found in the pilot was in the expanded pilot is that far fewer people actually used the free yard waste bags, but um, those that did, did find them to be an incentive. And we would use the same strategy of distributing using um, points around the city that uh, already exist. So we wouldn't be traveling to individual homes to give them their, their bags, but they would have access to um, a stack of up to 10 bags is what we figured in the costs. Um, some other incentives are that if uh, we've got a route wear system now that tracks um, pickups at different houses. So if we can prove that a house did not use the vacuum collection system, then part of the cost that we calculated was giving them a discount on their sanitation services in the January following the leaf collection season. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions from council. Council Member Smith. Thank you. Council Member Piedmont Smith had a question and then Council Member Scambolori in that order. Thank you, Ms. Kidd. It's a great idea, great program. Um, would you, uh, can you speak to the fee? What would the fee be for households? For um, the only fee that we would be charging or that we're recommending, because this is, this is all a recommendation, um, is that um, it would be $20 per pickup for on-demand pickup. And that would only occur in year three. So for the first year, um, we would start promoting and incentivizing, incentivizing the new way of doing this early in August. We would take the efficiencies that Michael Large and the Streets Division had already started and start the regular vacuum collection in November and then begin offering on-demand collection in December. The second year, it would be on-demand collection only the entire year and it would be free to acclimate people to signing up for it and, and how that system works. And then in the third year, it would be only on-demand collection and for a fee, $20 per um, per pickup, and we're assuming that houses would houses who opt in for that would have at least two pickups. And they would learn about it through the website. They would learn about it through the promotional materials. So right now, um, Public Works sends out mailers, and um, there's uh, social media promotion and word of mouth, and on the the neighborhood listservs. Thank you, Ms. Kidd, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Piedmont Smith. Yes, thank you so much for uh, all your work on this project and thank you to Mr. Winnie and Mr. Large as well. Um, I uh, had a question going back to Council Member Sims question about use of yard waste bags. Um, so the, the yard waste bags would, would be free um, and what about the pickup of the yard waste? Is is there, I believe there's currently a fee for that. Would would that continue or, or is it free? I'm sorry, I'd, we never use yard waste bags, so I'm not sure. Right, well, first of all, thank you for participating in, in the pilot. It's great that you've got that firsthand knowledge of it. Um, so the assumption in our cost calculations was that the yard waste bags would be free and that for the leafing season only, that yard waste bag pickup would also be free. And is that just in the transition phase or you're thinking of that long-term? In the um, calculations that we did, we assumed that it would be free for the leaf collection season, um, but that for the rest of the time that yard waste is collected, it would still incur the the one dollar per bag fee that is that is current. So um, we weren't anticipating that we would eventually charge during leafing season for yard waste bag pickup. Okay, it's something to consider in the long term because, of course, the ideal is to process the leaves on site, you know, through composting, mulching, Absolutely. and not have any greenhouse gas emissions involved with dealing with them. Right, right. 
we were just so happy that we didn't see an increase in the yard waste collection <laughs> from it that I think we were more focused on the vacuum collection, but your point is definitely well taken. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Scambolari. Yes, I have two questions. Can you go back to the slide for metric two, please, on cost savings? Sure. Okay, and just to make sure I'm understanding this, so in 2019, the 709-458 is a cost of running vacuum trucks around the city with no change, no incentive programs or anything, correct? Correct. Okay, and then in 2020, so the first pilot, um, how did that, how did you arrive at that number? I think I understand, but I wanna make sure I do. Yeah, this was actually, Separate from the pilot, Michael was part of our innovation team and he began kind of a, a sub pilot with the streets division on how might we make our current vacuuming, not thinking about um, doing away with vacuuming or going beyond vacuuming, but how might we just make our, our vacuum collection more efficient? And so he, um, that team together enlisted the help of Centerstone um, staff, employees of, of the Centerstone program to rake ahead of the vacuum trucks, which made the vacuum service itself a lot more efficient. And they were able to reduce costs that were mostly associated with labor. Michael, is there anything else that you'd like to add about that? No, Daisy, you're exactly right. Okay, costs with labor meaning running the vacuum trucks themselves became less expensive if we had the rake ahead kind of the labor and the overtime got it okay and then the households who mulch the pilot program is what dropped it even further so in other words we still ran the vacuum trucks or this is with us still running vacuum trucks but only on, only on demand correct and and is, does that presuppose any fees to homeowners or to property owners the, for, for vacuum truck service? Yes. So the, the low end of the operating cost, the 93541 is representative of revenue coming in from the fee-based service. If we did not charge a fee, then the cost for that program, assuming that we're doing everything that we can to grow and maintain the learning community and all of the incentives. So we are progressively increasing the percent of households that are not using uh, city services. That is the, uh, the high end of that operating cost, the 304,000. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Can you go ahead and unshare? Sure. And then I have one additional question, but I could wait if other council members want to go. Is there uh, other council questions? Not seeing any, so go ahead. Um, yes, thank you. Um, you mentioned there were 493 households in the kind of amped up pilot. Um, I know that we had hoped for more than that, and that's fine. We're, we're stair-stepping our way there. Um, but what are your thoughts on the kinds of incentives it's going to take to actually fill that gap? To, I mean, that, that seems like kind of a, I'm concerned we may reach kind of a stubborn point of resistance where just folks aren't interested or are not incentivized enough. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how to get over that hump, so to speak. Um, I'd love to engage the council in understanding that better, how to reach your constituents. Um, because I think you're in the very best position to help with this. Um, the way that we got to 493 was largely through the yard signs. When people, when we reached the 100 sign mark, then it just really started taking off. And even after we closed registration, and we did have to close it, unfortunately, because we needed to start collecting data, when we closed it on September 1st, for weeks afterwards, I was still getting 
um, people requesting to be part of the program. So there, there is a momentum that happens when you have, um, I, I think that visual really helps. And I think that's something that, that Joe touched on too, that we heard through the surveys, a lot of the participants said, oh, I found you through the, the yard sign or, oh, I found you through my neighborhood association or neighborhood listserv. Great, thank you, good work. All right, I see a hand up again from Council Member Rollo. Yeah, a comment and a question, Dave. To, um, do, do we still take those leaves and, and send them to Good Earth? Yeah. And do we, do we pay them for it or they, do they receive them? We do pay them. And so that's why the operating costs drop off quite a bit when we've got people managing and processing a majority of the leaves in their own yard. Okay, so this is just maybe a, a, a little recommendation. Uh, being a local grower, uh, there's nothing better than leaf leaves. The, the local soil is deprived, doesn't have enough carbon, so heavy clay. And there's nothing better for tomatoes um, <laughs> because of the micro, because of the fungi that live in the leaves. Um, and I've gone through the worst drought in like 50 years in 2012. And, and it was just amazing how well those plants did. So I wonder if we could um, have be a contact point between residents and local growers, local farmers, that whereby we either give them the leaves free of charge and they would appreciate them. And, you know, they could pick them up and pick up trucks somewhere or that we, you know, take out the middle person and have residents connect with local growers uh, who would be probably happy to take leaves off of resident sites where they have no room for them. Absolutely. So that might, that might be another avenue to explore. So we, thank you. we actually um, experimented with, with that during the pilot using the Facebook group. Oh, good. Um, there were individual yard owners who connected with one another because there are people who don't have enough trees and needed leaves. But we also had a few local small farms participating, connecting with residents saying, just put them on a tarp and leave them by your mailbox and we'll come by in our pickup and pick them up. So a lot of that happened, that mutual aid and peer-to-peer -peer connection. Wonderful, glad to hear that. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Any other council questions before we move on to our next report? Not seeing any. I do want to thank you, uh, Ms. Kidd, for presenting your PowerPoint in advance. That was very helpful to see it before the meeting tonight. And uh, also thanks to your team for this wonderful report. We're glad to, to hear about it uh, after, after the pilot and after, after all your hard work here. And again, thank you to Ms. Lauren Clements for being here this evening uh, from our uh, sustainability uh, efforts of ESD. So thanks to you all. We appreciate this very much. Thank you so much. All right, now next up, we have a report from Ms. Gloria Colombrana uh, from the hand department. And I hope that council will allow her um, the same opportunity to make her report this evening and with council questions following. Do we need to make any official motion or is everyone fine to just continue? Seeing shaking of heads. So Ms. Colombrana, welcome. Thank you for being here this evening. Hi, good evening, council members and everybody. Um, may I be allowed to share a quick presentation? Yes, please. Okay. Just, I was not able to get it to the packet, but um, hopefully this will be a succinct presentation with time for many questions. Um, so tonight I'm going to be introducing a little bit the concept or giving a report on the current state of the historic and conservation district guidelines. Um, so the, this is just a quick over, overview of, of what I want to talk about. I'll just let you look at it very quickly um, just to move things along. Is we are going to go over all of this. Um, so what are the what are these guidelines and what are they for? Um, Bloomington has 13 historic 
and conservation district. So currently 12 historic multi-property districts and one conservation multi-property district. So every uh, the, the verbiage that we have in our ordinances, uh, every individual historic site and landmark is also called a district. However, the guidelines are only, only cover when there's multiple buildings, whether it's a, a commercial district, an industrial district, or a, or a residential district. So what are these guidelines? Um, the guidelines are locally developed sort of instruction manuals created by the communities themselves in tandem with the with hand staff or the historic preservation staff and uh, the historic preservation commission. Um, the purpose, and so I, I cited on the presentation what we have in our ordinances and the purpose according to the certified local government manual. Uh, each of these guidelines is tailor-made, custom-made, very surgically made for each district and addresses the concerns that the owners have with their historic properties, with their neighbors' properties, with the community, with the scale, with the sizing. So it can be something as wide, as ample as, uh, or a concern of, let's make sure that the building patternings are maintained and as minute as let's make sure that the cornices are all representative of a very specific historic period. Um, so I also wanted to say like, okay, so why do we have these guidelines? Uh, Bloomington, like many other certified local governments throughout the United States, these are governments that uh, create a tie between local communities and towns and in cities with the state and the federal government. So these different communities have their historic preservation commissions uh, that make a lot of decisions regarding how the how different properties are taken care of and how the cities and how the communities are safeguarded the, the historic areas and one of those processes is a certi certificate sorry <laughs> where it's certificate of appropriateness uh, which is basically a type of permits process with what you can and can't do within a particular historic district or a particular uh, property and so the guidelines are literally the instruction manuals of what can you can and can't do with your property uh, within working in tandem with the UDO and working in tandem with other uh, laws and bylaws in the city. So the guidelines themselves provide historic context for the, the district. They tend to have maps and sort of show the parameter and the types of buildings and the different surveys of the buildings. Uh, they also provide a le level of detail to be reviewed um, and the instructions of can what can and can't be done. And they also distinguish the difference between a historic and a conservation district. So historic districts are, let me start. <laughs> conservation districts are sort of an, in an interstitial in-between space where the protections are just limited to moving a building, demolishing a building, or new construction. And in historic districts, the protections are much more fine-tuned to what you can and can't do with the facade, with the yard, and other details with the exterior of properties. So the Guidelines also detail what the HPC, the Historic Preservation Commission, uh, makes decisions versus staff. Staff would be myself and other members of hand at times. So these guidelines really are very different. They're all very unique. And each of them provides very specific details of what you can and can't do with your house. Um, because this is a short presentation, I can't go into detail. Uh, but you can definitely look at all those guidelines later on. They are all wonderful and different um, texts. So we currently have 13. I'm not going to list them all, but they are here. We have commercial areas. We have um, a lot of residential areas, vernacular 
um, neighborhoods with buildings that were working class. We also have areas that have very, some of the finest examples of architecture, des architect design buildings. And um, so there's a great variety and a different scope of the type of historicity of the buildings, of the neighborhood context, and also of what neighbors and what communities want to see within the changes or lack of changes they want to see um, within their within their properties. Oh, another thing I wanted to mention is that so this is very important. That's why I came back to this. Um, one of the various things that the guidelines also state is the role of neighborhood construction subcommittees. So these are groups of neighbors, oftentimes part of neighborhood associations, however, not always, but these are people who the neighborhood has determined to be the representatives um, to take a look at and provide input and feedback in during the process of the certificate of appropriateness. And so the guidelines establish number one, whether these committees exist or not, when they get to see the projects and sort of the interactions they would have with the HPC. So the guidelines have a lot of different, they do and juggle a lot of different roles. They also vary from 10 pages to 50 pages. Um, and another thing that the guidelines do is that they provide instructions on how they are amended later on, if that is something the community chooses to do so. Some of the oldest guidelines are from the 90s and early 2000s. Um, these are meant to be organic documents that are originally created when a conservation district is created. Um, that's a whole other process that I don't have time to talk to but about, but if anybody has questions or concerns, you're always free to contact me or ask uh, right in a few minutes. Um, but when a conservation district uh, goes through common council and all of the parameters of the space are determined, then the community and the ordinance has been passed, the community sits down with members from the Historic Preservation Commission and staff, and they determine more or less how the guidelines are going to look. Mind you, in the first three years, which is the conservation period time, the guidelines are basically have to stick to how the community wants to see the moving of buildings, the demolition of buildings, and new construction. So that's where the power lies. Like, if the community says that the buildings can't be more than two stories because they have to match the rest of the buildings, that that becomes a very powerful tool and what can and can't be done. If and when the community is elevated to a historic district after the three years, and then the community can go back and, uh, or kind of has to, because once it becomes a historic district, there are more responsi like responsibilities and the level of review is much more detailed. However, the community decides how detailed they want that level of review. Do we wanna look at cornices? Do we wanna look at window changes? And some communities say, well, you can change a window as long as the fenestration or the opening stays the same size and the material has to be this or that or no do not touch the windows this is that windows are actually a pretty big point of contention but that's not that's just one example of the many different levels of review it can extend from gardening to roof materials to siding and these are things that the community does and by community i mean a committee that um, is made uh, through public announcements and when they work on the on the guidelines and have them prepared, you know, like and approved by the HPC, these are uploaded into the city web page and it becomes a, a manual for anybody who wants to make a change to their properties. If the community wants to change anything in their guidelines, each guideline has its own instructions of how to go about that. And it usually starts with the community and then they come to staff and the HPC. Sorry if I'm talking quickly, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I want to make sure that, um, yeah, I was able to explain a little bit about how this particular and very useful and very detailed um, uh, tool is implemented throughout different spaces within Bloomington. So we're always on call. I'm actually in conversation with multiple communities that are in, in the process of redefining their guidelines. Um, Maple Heights in particular was elevated to historic district and they are already meeting and having conversations on how 
they want their guidelines to look, what the scope is going to be. I think these are still very preliminary conversations, but they're starting to be had. Um, and once they are ready, members from the HPC and myself will come in and work with them to um, take the conservation district guidelines and add the de level of detail that they desire to con uh, turn it into um, a historic district guidelines. There are other multiple communities that have expressed one level of interest or another in changing or defining, redefining some of the aspects. And each of them has a different process of how to do that. And with that, I um, yeah, open it up for questions and I'm done with my part. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to give this short presentation on historic and conservation district uh, guidelines. Thank you, Ms. Colon Brian. Can you please unshare your screen so I can see if there are any questions from our council? Councilmember Sims. Thank you. Thank you for the report, uh, Ms. Colon Brian. Um, part of your presentation had to do with revising historic preservation guidelines by working with the community, if I've gotten that correct. Um, I guess my question is how exactly does that happen? And do you have an example uh, of that, that you could share with us? That is an excellent question. And I am going to go to page 29. I pulled up one example because each of the 13 districts has a different way of going about this. So I pulled up the, give me one second, the Prospect Hill Local Historic District Guidelines as an example on my screen. And let me see if I can find the page so that I can be as accurate as possible. Um, okay, I'm not finding what I'm looking for. Sorry, let me go back to the table of contents very quickly. Um, I apologize for that, um, page 29, okay. And, and Ms. Colombrania, we really don't have too much more time here. How much longer of do you course. think it's going to take? Can you just cite maybe verbally an yeah. example that so, would be helpful to Mr. Smith's question? Yes, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so basically um, uh, the community, the standard practice would be for the community to show interest. They would um, arrange meetings amongst themselves and they would email me or whoever is the historic preservation program manager at the time to show them the interest. And then I would bring someone and bring it to the HPC. The HPC would uh, send, uh, they they have a subcommittee of people who work with guidelines and they would send a member to member or two to work with the community. And then they would come back with the HPC and ask for an amendment. Okay, thank you. Um, for an example, would could that include roofing or exterior of, of a historic house, for example, or so I guess, I guess I'm confused uh, on what that includes and how yes, it could so be the, totally revised if we've already approved it. Yes, no, um, not necessarily total revisions, but maybe an aspect where we, uh, if they didn't incorporate, some of them incorporate accessibility aspects, but other historic districts don't have accessibility components and a historic district wants to update to include language on accessibility or language on the evolving green uh, technology for architecture, then that's a way to incorporate new language. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Additional questions, Council Member Flaherty. Yeah, I'm just curious about your perspective, uh, Ms. Colombrania, about um, in any tensions underlying historic preservation at times with respect to um, te technology improvements, you know, access to solar energy, more affordable housing types, other goals the city has that sometimes historic preservation can be a barrier to and how to balance those things. Ah, yeah. Um, hmm. Historic preservation as a barrier is something that we can discuss and debate for quite a while. Um, but that said, um, Yes, te evolving technology is something that is incorporated and uh, and uh, some historic districts uh, talk more explicitly about how to incorporate um, 
for example, solar panels, but usually an argument and exception is made when something is going to benefit the historic, if it doesn't cause like permanent changes or extreme changes to the building or the house, for example, so solar panels are very visible and they do cause a change to the roofs. However, there is an understanding that if the main facade is towards the south, then that is something to be taken into account. So there's always that sort of mitigation. Um, when it comes to green sort of green technology and other forms of technology as well um, these things are taken into account but some like going back to the guidelines some of the guidelines are more explicit about it than others it all depends on um, the conversations that com and the priorities that the communities have made for themselves got it. thank you so much so it, it comes down to the folks who are creating the standards for their neighborhoods on kind of an ad hoc basis as opposed to a uniform approach that is correct. On how to accommodate those things. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Additional questions from council? Uh, seeing none, Ms. Colombrano, again, we appreciate you being here. I know you and I have had discussions recently about uh, some of the challenges that you're having uh, with respect to communicating with um, the various um, historic uh, preservation units here in the city and making sure that there's proper notice for the things that are happening around them in their neighborhoods. So uh, we may have a uh, need for a further conversation about that later. But again, I appreciate your brief overview this evening. It's been very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. All right, next on our agenda, and we will move on to council committee reports if there are any this evening. And let me see if I got any. No, we don't. So now we move on to our first opportunity for public comment. And this is for matters not on this evening's agenda. And so um, if we can see a show of hands for individuals who may wish to make a comment this evening on a matter that we have not yet, um, that we will not be getting to later in, in our agenda. So I'm seeing one hand up at the moment on a matter not on tonight's agenda. Anyone else? And um, Mr. Lucas, if we can call on, I believe Connor Bickle is our first comment. And if Mr. Bickle is here, if he's unmuted. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, you will have five minutes or less to make your comment. Awesome. Hello and good evening. My name is Connor Bickle. Um, I'm a second year student at Indiana University's Kelly School of Business studying economic consulting and business analytics. I'm a current resident of Bloomington and I love the city. The inclusivity, the diverse population of individuals, and the constant drive to achieve social justice all further the well-being of the citizens. The past six months, however, have been difficult due to one principle, my lack of sleep and the current city noise ordinances. Before I begin, I think it's important to provide my background. I'm a student who has a passion for giving back to the community I live in. I've all, I'm a volunteer tour guide for the business school. I participate in the Singing Hoosiers, a show choir that educates local high school music education programs, and work for a pro bono on-campus consulting firm that consults for local nonprofits in Bloomington. As you can see, my schedule rarely has downtime, with the only time I have to myself being when I'm asleep. Yet the early large-scale noises that take place on 14th Street have disrupted not only my lifestyle and well-being, but all parties who live near this construction site. I currently live in a house that is over three decades old and has thin walls and windows. 14th Street is home to very own houses and that have been upscaled on the inside, but don't touch the decades old structure. Terratrace apartments, the houses, and those across the railroad tracks, all are parties that are having this issue. On top of that, 14th Street is currently home to the largest off-campus housing project in the history of Bloomington. This takes place 10 feet from my bedroom. Upon signing my lease, I was excited to move into my own home for the first time in a community that I love. Now, I regret almost every decision I've made for the sole basis of I can't sleep in my own house. My parents have insisted I sleep at others' houses before interviews, large exams, and when I need actual sleep. This shouldn't be the case in what I have to do to succeed in school. The construction site begins major drilling every day from 6 to 8 a.m. with the sound piercing any form of damper. I wear earplugs, headphones that cancel noise, and have white noise, yet it still pierces through. 
The constant large scale noise that takes place from 6 to 8 a.m. has caused me major mood changes, lack of focus and happiness, and has directly caused my academics to drastically decline. I cannot receive quality sleep due to the constant barrage of drilling, dump trucks dumping and arriving prior to the construction beginning, and overall lack of understanding for the community that is five feet away from its site. Bloomington has strict noise ordinances that target students and current residences, yet lack current fill safes that protect the community and those who live near major areas of economic growth. One of Bloomington's major rental market segments is students. Construction currently is exempt from the most noise ordinances if it takes place typically between 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. I want to ask the council two questions. Do you wake up every day before or at 6 a.m.? And did you wake up every day prior to 8 a.m. as a 19 to 20 year old? I've come to the council for two reasons. One being I've exhausted all options and I'm afraid for my academics declining even more. And two being that this is an ongoing issue that's constantly increasing. We can see this everywhere. 14th Street, the communities surrounding Verve apartments under construction and those who have lived the near the new Atlas apartments. The city needs to protect the community and ensure these projects do not affect the well-being and overall health of its population. Last year, I was hospitalized for a week due to not being able to recover from a sickness that I had for an entire month, much of which I attribute to the inability to heal because I did not receive quality sleep, waking up at 7 a.m. each morning and hearing drilling until almost 10 p.m. These projects are marketed towards students and are created to house students, yet as it stands currently, disregard students who live near them. I'm calling on the city council to consider those who have been directly impacted by these projects and to rediscuss the current noise exemptions, pushing them back one or two hours or even after the sun rises so that individuals that already invest in the community can continue to do so while not risking their own well-being. Thank you. Thank you very much for that information. Do we have additional members of the public who wish to make a comment this evening? I'm not seeing any hands. Are you, Mr. Lucas? I don't at the moment. Uh, perhaps we could remind folks that if they would like to uh, make a comment, they can find the raise hand button and their control bar uh, under the reactions tab or under the more tab. And if you're not able to locate uh, the raise hand feature under either of those places, please just send a chat through uh, to the meeting host and we can recognize you that way. Thank you. And while we're perhaps waiting just a, a, a minute or two, remind people that also um, council is happy to receive emails for any issue that you may wish to bring to our attention at council at bloomington.in.gov. And with no more hands being raised that I can see, let us now move on to appointments to boards and commissions, and we do have quite a few. Uh, my thanks to everybody, all of my colleagues, for working so hard on filling these vacancies. What I would like to do this evening in the interest of time and make things more streamlined is with each team, each interview team, if you would please make all of your, um, your um, recommendations for nominations all at the same time. And then at the very end of team C, team B, team A's recommendations, then we'll do our roll call vote to approve those recommendations. So last week, I last time, I believe I started with team A. Let's start this evening with team C to see who all the recommendations are for your boards and commissions. Uh Thank you, Madam President. I move the appointment of the following individuals recommended by Team C. Heard me. Uh, to the Bloomington Arts Commission, seat C3. Uh, Suzanne, um, sorry. I think the, the name is incorrect. Yep. Suzanne, Suzanne Ryan Melamed, is that who you have? Ryan Melamed, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, to Bloomington Arts Commission, seat C5, Nia Carlsgaard. To the Historic Preservation Commission, seat C3, Anersto Castaneda. To uh, seat C1 of the Redevelopment Commission, Randy Cassidy. To seat C2 of the uh, Bloomington Redevelopment Commission, Deborah Meyerson. To the uh, seat C1 of the Tree Commission, Mary uh, Welts. And to seat C2 of the Bloomington Tree Commission, Stephanie Freeman Day. 
Second. And uh, Council Member Piedmont Smith, I believe we have one more from Team C, correct? Yes, if you wouldn't mind a friendly amendment, I would also like to recommend for appointment Jack Waninger to the Parking Commission. Thank you. All right, do we have a second? Second. Okay, moved and seconded. And all in favor of those recommendations for Team C's vacancies, let's uh, have our clerk call the roll. I'm seeing a hand up for Ms. Rosenbarger, Council Member Rosenbarger. I'm sorry, that happened so fast. Um, I was just trying to write them down. Did the Deborah, uh, there's a question. Deborah Meyerson is not, not on RDC, but the recommendation is to appoint her to the Tree Commission. Is that what I heard? No, no, uh, that's incorrect. There were two seats open. Okay. Seat C1 is for uh, proposed to be for Randy Cassidy, and seat C2 of the Redevelopment Commission uh, will be Deborah Myerson, and I believe that that okay. is her uh, her current seat this time because she is okay. on. Okay, I think my I think I had a delay, and then I could not understand because I didn't know that um, we had a tree commission. You, All right, with that clarification, is everybody clear on those those nominations? I think, I think Councilmember Roller, you're breaking up a little bit with your connection. That's probably been an issue, right? Being able to hear. All right, with that moved and seconded, and no further questions, uh, will the clerk please call the roll? And you are muted. <laughs> Bummer. Okay, uh, let's try that again. We'll start with Council Member Rosenberger. Yes. Yeah. Sims? Yes. Olin? Yes. Scambaluri? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Smith? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Thank you. All right. With those uh, nominations made, let us move to Team B. Uh, do you have boards and commissions? Council Member Walwin. Yes, Madam Chair, I'd like to make the following uh, nominations. Uh, let me, I'm trying to pull up my notes too here. Um, uh, team B would like to nominate Satish Buyuri to seat C1 of the Community Advisory and Public Safety Commission, Jason Michalik to seat C2 of the same commission, Stephen Reynolds to seat C4 of the Traffic Commission, and David Sabag uh, for, uh, I'm not sure what seat, uh, uh, I, I think it's seat C5 of the Traffic Commission. I, I need to look it up, I'm sorry. I don't have this. Leave that seat C1. C1, I'm sorry. Thank you. All right. That's are, it. Are all, those are all yours. Do we have a second? Second. All right. Moved and seconded. Will the clerk please call the roll on Team B's recommendations? Um, yeah. Yes. Councilmember Sims? Yes. Bullen? Yes. Gambalori? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Morello? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Smith? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Rosenberger? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, council, uh, council member, <laughs> Clerk Bolden. <laughs> um, I noticed that Team B had more recommendations for appointments that weren't listed, and I didn't know if they would like to make the rest of them. It's all I had on the form that I had, so I'd welcome one of my teammates to make the other ones because I, I only had that, that list. Is there a representative from Team B who can make those additional recommendations? Council Member Flaherty? I, I, yeah, I have um, a spreadsheet in front of me that I think is representative of, of the full uh, list. Could Would Clerk Bolden mind repeating uh, briefly the motion we just um, 
voted on just the names to make sure I don't repeat those ones. I wasn't expecting a partial recommendation, so I didn't. Keep <laughs> My that. apology. I can do it. It's Satish Fayuri, Jason Michalek, uh, Stephen Reynolds, and David Sabag. Okay. Uh, on behalf of Inri Team B, I would like to recommend for appointment Mike Satterfield to seat C2 of the Bloomington Digital Underground Advisory Committee, Shafali Prabhakar to seat C2 of the Commission on the Status of Women, Ayami Jocelyn to seat C3 on the Commission on the Status of Women, Nej the Rootsong to seat C5 of the Community Advisory and Public Safety Commission, and Luke Swain to seat C3 of the Environmental Commission. And I'll second. second. So that's been moved and seconded. Does that complete their list, Clerk Bolden? Bolden? All right, so let's go ahead and call the roll on those additions. Okay, Council Member Volan? Yes. Cambalori? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Smith? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. And Sims? Yes. Thank you. All right, moving on to Team A. Do you have recommendations for us this evening, Council Member Sims? Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I move recommendation for reappointment uh, for the Animal Control Commission, seat C1, Sita Cohen. For the Board of Zoning Appeal, seat C1, Joe Brockmorton. For the Commission on Aging, seat C1, Jennifer Donegan. Seat C2 on the Commission of Aging, Mr. Robert Deppert. The Housing Quality Appeals Board, seat C2, Nicholas Carter. The Human Rights Commission, seat C2, Judge Valerie Houghton. Human Rights Commission, seat C3, uh, Byron Bangert. Second. Moved and seconded. Will the clerk please call the roll on Team A's recommendations? Yes. Councilmember Scambalori? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Smith? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Rosenberger? Yes. Sims? Yes. And Volin? Yes. Thank you. All right, that concludes our uh, board and commission appointments. Our thanks to all the residents and citizens who apply and who have been appointed this evening. We appreciate all of your service. And uh, with that, it is time to move on to legislation for second readings and resolutions. Madam President, I move that resolution 2207 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. Moved and seconded. Will the clerk please call the roll? Yes. Councilmember Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Smith? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Rosenberger? Yes. Sims? Yes. Volin? Yes. And Scambalori. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And will the clerk please read? Resolution 2207 to approve recommendations of the mayor for distribution of community development block grant CDBG funds for 20, 2022. Sorry. <laughs> the synopsis is as follows. The City of Bloomington is eligible for a Community Development Block Grant from the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, estimated to be $900,000, along with $200,000 of available prior CDBG fund grant funding. 
This resolution outlines program recommendations by the mayor with input from the Citizens Advisory Committee and the Redevelopment Commission. Pursuant to federal regulations, CDBG allocations are made across the following general program areas, social services programs, physical improvements, and administrative services. Thank you. Madam President, I move that resolution 2207 be adopted. Second. All right, and who is with us this evening to present on the CDBG? Uh, John Zodi, the director of the hand department, uh, President Sandberg. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, council members. Uh, on behalf of the administration and the uh, staff at the Housing and Neighborhood Development Department here at the city, I want to uh, ask for your consideration of the 2022 recommendations as the resolution reads for the community development block grant dollars that the city is uh, estimated to receive uh, for the next program year, which will begin on, on June 1st. I want to thank the hand staff and especially the members of our Citizens Advisory Committee. There are about 18 members. Uh, uh, some of which are, are you uh, uh, who, who have served on that committee and who did this year, um, who uh, volunteer their time and look over these applications and, and make their recommendations on behalf of their community. And so uh, what we are presenting to you tonight uh, is um, recommendations for the awarding of dollars to 17 local uh, organizations, um, totaling about $1.1 million. Uh, as the resolution read, there is a percentage that is allocated to each of those categories, um, we can have 15% go to public or social services, which are basically the same uh, thing. We have 20% uh, go to administration, which is uh, helps with the administration of the program here at the city and in the department. And then the remainder, which is about 65%, goes to physical improvement projects around the city. So um, the uh, uh, recommendations are before you. They were passed unanimously by the uh, Redevelopment Commission and are before you tonight. I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, are there any questions? And when you say they are before us this evening, did you have any kind of um, screen to share with us to, sh to show who gets those awards or was that just information from our packet that we have all received? Just your packet, Madam President. I'm happy to share a screen that would, that would show that more visibly if you'd like, but okay. uh, I just have the packet information. Thank you very much. Let's go to council questions to see if council would like to get a review. Yes, uh, council member Piedmont Smith, see your first hand. Yes, thank you, Madam President. And thank you, Mr. Zodi. Um, for the benefit of the public, I would appreciate if uh, Mr. Zodi or the uh, meeting host could share the screen and show the proposed allocations. I'm glad to do that here, unless, uh... Mr. Lucas, if it's easier for you too, if you've got it pulled up, I have it as well, but if I'm happy to uh, have you do it if it's more efficient. I can share and that in right the meantime, now. Okay, great. Can everybody yeah. see? Could we have a verbal? These are the physical improvements That's followed right. by the social services. Yeah. That's correct. So you'll see the project descriptions and the uh, recommended amount for funding um, for each of those. And then they're listed more succinctly in the resolution, but uh, this does give a project description uh, as well and, and order them that way. All right, with that information on the screen, again, um, Council Member Piedmont Smith, did you have any questions regarding that or did you just want the clarification of seeing who, who got the awards? No, I just wanted to, uh, to see this and share it with the public, so thank you. Thank you. All right, do we still need that screen up? Additional questions from Council? And I am not seeing any. Do we have any members of the public this evening who wish to make a comment on the CDBG awards for, for this year? If so, you may raise your hand to make a comment. 
And uh, again, I'll just remind the public, if you're looking for the raise hand feature, it should be under either the reaction tab or the more tab in your control bar. And if you're not able to locate it, uh, please just send a message via chat to the meeting host. And seeing no public comment, let us go back to the council for any kind. Yes, council member Piedmont Smith for any final comment or question. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, to make sure we had um, a few weeks ago, we had the sidewalk committee or the transportation committee report with sidewalk allocations. And one of them, I think uh, at that point, it, we did mention the Adam Street sidewalk. Um, so is this uh, funding for physical improvements for the city of Bloomington engineering? Um, does that mesh with what the transportation committee had decided mm -hmm. uh, on that project, I don't know if, if Mr. Smith is as chair of the transportation committee or if Mr. Zodi could answer that. I have no knowledge of it meshing uh, with the physical aspects of it. Um, maybe, perhaps Mr. Zodi has some idea. I understand the, the question, Council Member Piedmont Smith. So the, there's $140,000 recommendation for sidewalk improvements on Adams Street. Uh, so uh, were you looking for clarification on the amount or if there is a, um, another connection there on the project? I'm happy to get more information from you or for you, excuse me, uh, that we can follow up with you. But does that answer your question? Yeah, I thought maybe some of that project was being funded through the council sidewalk funds and some through CDBG. So I see Mr. Lucas maybe. Yes, could, answer. could you like to clarify? Yes, in the council's uh, sidewalk uh, recommendations. Uh, the council was expecting $120,000 of that project to come from the uh, council sidewalk uh, funding from the Alternative Transportation Fund and had anticipated $140,000 uh, in other funds, which I believe is the uh, amount recommended in this resolution to come from CDBG funds. So yes, I, I believe they mesh up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. Additional questions or final comments from council with respect to our CDBG allocations? Council member Sims. Thank you. And thank you for the presentation, Mr. Zodi. Um, also want to give a shout out to the members of the CHC as well. Um, a lot of hard work that goes into here. Can you explain to the public, and I know the amounts that uh, of funding that we're talking about tonight are projections. Um, so can you explain to the public what happens in the event that we don't receive as much as, as we projected with regard to this legislation? Sure, that's a great question. Thank you, Council Member Sims. So the, um, the HUD Department, Housing and Urban Development, uh, which is the federal agency that allocates funding directly to the city of Bloomington. So we are what is known as um, an entitlement community. And the term entitlement means that simply uh, we are a city of a uh, population of 50,000 or above, which entitles us uh, to receive that money directly rather than going through the state of Indiana. So um, if you look at surrounding communities, Martinsville, uh, Nashville, places like that go through the state, uh, the uh, state government to, to get uh, allocated dollars for different projects, uh, Bloomington receives their money directly. And so each program year, we are, there's a sort of a timeline that uh, we are subject to where we uh, are uh, charged with presenting an annual action plan, um, as well as um, that, that will contain our goals for the next program year. We are currently in the 2021 program year and the 2022 program year uh, will begin on June 1st. These projects that, that you're considering this evening are for the next program year. And to keep everything on track, uh, we have an estimated amount that we uh, put forth. Uh, based on our allocation last year, we got about 920000 uh, We uh, were a conservative in that estimate. Uh, don't have a reason to believe that we would get less. We could get more. We just don't know yet. And we won't find out until later this year, probably sometime in the summer, if, if, if not just before. And so um, the uh, knowing that, the Citizens Advisory Committee uh, makes recommendations based on that funding, and then they make provisions uh, in the resolution that would say, if we get more, here's what will happen. If we get less, here's what will happen. And so for the most part, on our social service programming, um, the, or, the organizations that were awarded will get um, a proportional amount uh, more or a proportional amount less, depending on the amount the city receives. 
for physical improvements, the uh, CAC decided to uh, order some projects. Uh, I believe Bloomington Housing Authority would be the first on the list if we got more money um, to uh, get get some more funding and so on and so forth. I will also say, Councilmember Sims, as a as a uh, an additional point to your question that um, we are talking about the figure of 900,000, yet we are asking you to approve $1.1 million in recommendations. There's $200,000 of money that we are carrying forward. There is um, unallocated money through the Community Development Block Grant Program at the city that we are uh, working to expend, and that, that happens uh, when programs come in under budget, when a program doesn't move forward. Um, there's, there could be leftover administration money, which we try to use as much as possible. Uh, but year after year, there could be leftover. And so there has been leftover. And so we are working to expend those dollars uh, in an organized fashion. Uh, and so uh, we are recommending due to the need and the demand that we had this year, we are uh, recommending that $200,000 be moved forward. And that's a decision that it went through the Citizens Advisory Committee as well. So that's the additional 200,000 that you may see in there. And I uh, wanted to make sure that was discussed publicly as well. Uh, and I think you brought that question up uh, on the work session and wanted to make sure I closed the loop on that. So hope that answers your question. Oh, it did, thank you. And I think it's important to share um, with those out in the public who actually scrutinize it and maybe even care a little bit more uh, for full transparency. So I appreciate um, your response. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments from council. And seeing that, I will just thank our council colleagues, uh, Council Member Smith and Council Member Rosenbarger for also participating in uh, these allocations and working with the CAC. So thank you. With this, will the clerk please call the roll on resolution 22-07. Yes, Council Member Rallo. Yes. Clarity. Yes. Smith. Yes. Piedmont Smith. Yes. Rosenbarger. Yes. Sims. Yes. Volan. Yes. Scambaluri. Yes. And Sandberg. Yes. Thank you all. That passes 9-0. And thank you, Mr. Zodi. Now we move on to the next item for second reading. Thank you, Madam President. I move that resolution 2206 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. Thank you. Will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, Council Member Flaherty. Yes. Smith? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Okay, I seem to have lost uh, Council Member Piedmont Smith, so we'll move on to Rosenberger. Yes. Sims? Yes. Volan? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. And Rallo? Yes. Thank you. And we'll so, let's come back around to Council Member Piedmont Smith. And Council Member Piedmont Smith. I assume this is to introduce the ordinance. Yes. Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. And will the clerk please read? Um, yes, resolution 2206 to confirm resolution 2205 designating an economic revitalization area, approving the statement of benefits and authorizing an abatement period for real property improvements and personal property regarding properties at 1300 South Patterson Drive, Catalan, Indiana, LLC petitioner. The synopsis is as follows. This resolution confirms resolution 2205 which designated nine parcels located at and around 1300 South Patterson Drive as an economic revitalization area for Catalan Indiana LLC petitioner. 
This designation was recommended by the Economic Development Commission on January 31st, 2022, and will enable the proposed $350 million project, including the real and personal property improvements to be eligible for tax abatement. The resolution affirms the council's approval of the petitioner's statement of benefits, authorizes a 10-year period of abatement for real property improvements, authorizes a 20-year period of abatement for personal property, and sets the deduction schedules for each. That's all. Thank you. Madam President, I move that resolution 2206 be adopted. Second. Thank you. And before we begin the official presentation here, um, I will call on our um, attorney um, to remind us about the public comment period this evening and what that constitutes with respect to this piece of legislation in terms of the public hearing. Yes, thank you. Um, I'll just note for the public that the uh, opportunity for public comment on this item will serve as the statutorily required uh, public hearing. Uh, where any objections and remonstrances uh, on this item will be heard by the council. Thank you. Thank you. And with us this evening to present is Mr. Alex Crowley, Economic and Sustainable Development Director. Thank you, President Sandberg. Uh, good evening, council members and members of the public. I'm Alex Crowley, Director of Economic and Sustainable Development for the City of Bloomington. I'm pleased to be here again this evening uh, with you to um, review this important economic opportunity, and, uh, we, and we have discussed it, as you know, on February 16th. So as you know, this evening, you'll be considering the confirmatory resolution of a tax abatement to help attract a significant potential capital investment and proposed job growth commitment by Catalan, now one of our community's largest private employers. We appreciate the council's unanimous support of Res resolution 2204, which on February 16th designated an economic revitalization area and approved the company's statement of benefits and the city's recommended abatement, for both real property and personal property. We hope you will similarly uh, demonstrate your strong support for the confirmatory resolution this evening and your support for the significant potential investment and the benefits it will bring to Bloomington and to the surrounding region. Your vote of yes on this effort would be an important signal from the council and the community to other employers interested in expanding and investing in and creating high wage jobs in Bloomington. I will briefly summarize the information we presented on uh, at the February 16th council meeting, highlighting some of the most important elements of the recommendation and further addressing questions some council members had at the meeting and in subsequent discussions. I look forward to answering any questions you may have at the end of my remarks. And while Catalan will not be presenting today, Andrew Espejo and Grant Eccles from Catalan and Jacob Everett from McGuire Sponsor are here to help answer questions as well. Before I delve into the details, I wanted to start by reiterating some important points from our previous discussion. First, allow me to remind you how extraordinary the scale of this investment and job growth would be and how extremely rare this is for a community our size. The capital investment would significantly augment the investment on the site since Thompson announced its departure 25 years ago. Second, while we all recognize that this kind of significant growth, especially job growth, can be challenging to absorb in the short term, I know all of us here in Bloomington would much rather tackle the challenge of growth than the challenge of decline. Third, a reminder, that Bloomington is competing for this growth. Catalan has not made a decision yet about where to invest. And as we discussed previously, the company has other US facilities with similarly strong biologics capabilities. We stack up well. And what we're hopefully doing this evening is to further tip the scale in our direction. Fourth, we have specifically uh, designed this incentive to minimize our risk. If Catalan doesn't invest or grow jobs at these commitment levels, we are not out of pocket, and Catalan won't realize any value in the incentive. Unlike horror stories like the Foxconn deal in Wisconsin and others, for example, we're not putting upfront cash into this deal, and that's by design. Our abatement is only actualized if and when the commitments materialize. Furthermore, there's a statutory annual reporting requirement that will provide us an opportunity to evaluate Catalan's performance against its commitments. 
And finally, and perhaps most important, while an abatement is provided to a corporation, the benefits of this public-private partnership in the end are realized by individual workers and residents, people, seeking to improve their job prospects and lives as cattle and employees and indirectly in jobs and businesses and through, an, through other benefits across the community. To put it simply, this kind of wage growth allows more Bloomingtonians to participate in our community's prosperity and helps us push back against our high poverty rate. Economic development is a long game, which can take years to develop, but we're seeing the results of previ previous risks and investments we and the private sector have made in this former Thompson site and in Bloomington generally. And this is an opportunity to do our part to continue those successes. So let's review what's before us today. As you see here in the shaded gray uh, column to the right, <clears throat> Catalan is proposing to invest $350 million in real and personal property capital investments to retain 3,212 jobs and to add 1,000 new jobs at its Bloomington facility. This is an extraordinary scale of investment and job growth for a community our size. It bears reminding ourselves that this proposal comes on the heels of previous commitments the company has made against the 2019 tax abatement, which council approved to its credit. As you will see here, since acquiring Pharmaca in 2017, Catalan has committed to 125 million in capital investments and to grow by 200 jobs. As of their 2021 CF1 data, you will see that the company has significantly exceeded its job commitments. Data regarding capitals, uh, Catalan's capital investments, which were in progress uh, through last year, won't be available until they file their CF1 forms in May. We expect them to have met or exceeded those commitments as well. To position Bloomington to receive this investment, we recommend a 10-year 50% real property tax abatement and a 20-year 90% uh, personal property tax abatement. And as we previously noted, this is the first time Bloomington recommends the 20-year personal property abatement, which became available to us precisely for these types of significant projects in 2014. And it's important to note that Catalan has 3,212 retained jobs as of, the, of this uh, 2022 tax abatement application, which means there's been a significant job growth outside of the previous abatement. Remember, when they bought Cook Pharmaca, they inherited approximately 600 jobs. Now they have 3,212. As with previous and other tax abatements, and if confirmed this evening, we will formalize the commitments through a memorandum of agreement with the company which will include, include provisions addressing implications of, under, of any underperformance by the company against its commitments, specifically our ability to roll back any benefits we would extend this evening should Catalan fall short on its capital or jobs commitments. The annual tax abatement reporting process to council will also provide us all visibility into the company's performance on a yearly basis. As we detailed during the last discussion, Catalan is pro providing job op opportunities across skill levels with a substantial portion at significantly higher wage levels than Bloomington typically offers, especially in the manufacturing sector. Notably, there's also significant opportunity for lesser skilled workers, which is important to help distribute the opportunities across the, the community. Expanding on this, Bloomington and the nation have seen significant stratification of opportunity in the past several decades. The manufacturing worker is falling behind while the professional class and higher wage jobs are seeing accelerating wage growth. As you'll see here in this chart from the Center for Budget and Policy uh, Priorities, and President Biden highlight, highlighted this discrepancy last evening during the State of the Union, the highest deciles of wages have been accelerating significantly faster than the middle or lower deciles over the past 40 years. This is commonly referred to as the income gap. And taking a look at Monroe County data from 2010 to 2020, you'll see specifically that weekly wage growth comparisons between manufacturing and professional and technical services is similarly diverging. In the measured period, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there's nearly a 13 percentage point difference between the faster wage acceleration, the professional and technical services sector here in orange on the chart, and manufacturing here in blue on the chart. 
What's particularly important about Catalan's distribution of opportunity is that it includes a substantial number of jobs reflecting kind of wage growth we want to see in manufacturing and other jobs where you don't necessarily need to have a PhD to earn a good living. Yes, it's putting upward wage pressure on certain sectors and companies here, but that's exactly what we need. Wage growth makes Bloomington more affordable for more people. Wage growth makes housing more affordable. As we detailed during the last discussion, housing cost increases and other costs of living have outpaced wages for more than a decade in Bloomington, and this provides some re-leveling of that imbalance. It will allow more workers to participate in our community's prosperity. As the mayor discussed during the State of the City address last week, and we ourselves discussed in our previous meeting, wage growth is a critical issue for Bloomington, and we're seeing some recent improvements. You'll see on this chart that in a quarter one 2017, we ranked at the bottom of the comparison set, and I've used national average, the statewide average, and a handful of other Indiana communities as our comparison. In 2018, where the rest of the group saw increased wages, we were almost stagnant. We advanced somewhat in 2019, the middle of our these graphs, but remained behind the pack. Then, starting in 2020 and again in 2021, we've seen wage growth more aligned with national and statewide averages, and now are ahead of our fellow Indiana uh, cities in the comparison set. That kind of growth comes from a number of factors, including retaining and attracting higher wage jobs, which this Catalan opportunity represents. To address some concerns we've had regarding the significant growth opportunity, I'd like to focus on a couple of issues and questions and spend a few minutes on each. The first is the question of how this growth may affect our current housing market in Bloomington and the surrounding areas. As we discussed several weeks ago, and we all know, the housing market in Bloomington is expensive. That's true both for home ownership and rentals. As you'll see here, this is an issue that the administration and council have been collaborating on for a number of years and with some success. The 2020 Bloomington Housing Study, which used 2018 and prior data as a baseline, forecasted an overall need of approximately 2,600 units by 2030. Since that study's baseline data, the community has seen some significant development, including almost 225 units brought online that were in the pipeline at the time, more than 1,600 units under construction as we speak, and an additional 900 units approved and moving into production. To add to this, more than 830 units are forecasted from the Hopewell project. While these units will come online at varying rates, we believe the city is on track to exceed the recommendations of the housing study. And all of these data do not count the constant flow of development proposals percolating in advance of planned commission review, nor future developments, including upcoming opportunities in the southeast part of town. The next issue is the question of whether we're giving up revenues from Catalan that we would otherwise get, uh, or more ominously, whether the community is somehow paying more for Catalan's growth. First, we should remind ourselves that Bloomington does not have a strong cadre of major property tax paying employers. We have mayor, major employers, but because some of them are exempt, they aren't all paying property taxes. We need to diversify our tax base to grow and add more private tax paying employers. And if you look at Catalan, you'll see that even with the prior tax abatement and other deductions, they are already paying approximately 1.25 million in, in taxes annually between their real and personal property liabilities. And that's in addition to the county optional income tax revenues we gain from a portion of their employees and the multiplier effect of those jobs in the community estimated here at 1.4 million and 843,000 annually, respectively. We expect Catalan's taxes to increase as their 2021 investments come online. And if approved, the unabated portions of this potential investment would add into that as well. But more importantly, and this is where I think today's Herald Times article was perhaps too narrow, the real benefit of this kind of investment by Catalan goes well beyond the narrow Catalan only tax calculation. The article is technically correct that if a community's assessed value increases beyond the increase in, in levy, tax rates can go down. But the article had a number of emissions and flawed assumptions encapsulated in the quotation, quote, if Catalan made the investment without getting a tax break from the city, and other factors remained unchanged, 
all property owners in Monroe County would see their property tax bills decline. So some of the issues that I see are as follows. Number one, it posited a scenario where Catalan would invest capital and commit to job growth without an abatement, which is in direct opposition to the premise of the abatement. If this were the case, we would not be rec recommending an abatement. Number two, the article misunderstood the context of a community's economic growth. This kind of investment is part of a whole economy, not a single isolated factor with a one-for-one -one effect on tax rates. In other words, other factors do not remain unchanged. The article's primary assertions, number three, uh, did not capture the broader economic value of this kind of growth, whether on spending, indirect job growth, wage growth, and property and income tax revenues. And number four, it conflated to uh, it conflated a lack of decrease in annual in individual tax burdens with an increase in the tax burden. To be clear, for our purposes, extending the abatement does not actively increase the individual's tax burden and may actually slightly decrease the rate. Put simply, the article somewhat oversimplified the equation and thereby potentially left an incorrect impression. Having said this, I do agree with the quotation in the final paragraph that, quote, Bloomington officials are in an enviable position to even be able to carefully consider Catalan's request. In many other places in Indiana, councils would not hesitate to approve a tax break for a $350 million investment and a 1,000 uh, high paying jobs, end quote. As Councilmember Smith correctly pointed out at the last meeting, to have an estimated 30 million plus dollars of salaries washing around the economy is significant. Businesses supplying Catalan and its employees grow and benefit. They hire more people, they invest more, and additionally, housing developments come online to serve the growth, and that drives increased assessed values. The point is not whether a hypothetical investment without an abatement would lower someone's tax bill. It's rather that the overall community benefit and broader economic growth will help Bloomington thrive long into the future. And finally, there's been some question about whether Catalan's corporate responsibilities and engagement have been adequate over the past several years in Bloomington. Or put another way, what can the Bloomington community expect from Catalan in the years ahead? First, the city and the BEDC have been fully engaged with the company over these past six plus months, and we've had strong relations with Catalan since their arrival. They are responsive, available, and eager to strengthen their ties with the community, as Andrew noted in, in the last meeting. We're pleased to have Andrew and Grant and his leadership team engage with Bloomington. A small but important example of this is that Catalan has formally committed to our requests for their involvement in our nascent TDM efforts. They will be the first private sector partner for the upcoming launch of Go Bloomington, our local TDM program, including promotion of the program to employees, use of their logo on our marketing materials, designating a Catalan manager to support TDM efforts. And we look forward to developing and expanding our TDM program using Catalan's example as a guide for other employers. Catalan pu publishes an annual report uh, a responsibility report, and in their 2021 report highlighted that 50 projects focusing on energy efficiency at Catalan's global facilities were completed through the end of 2020 fiscal year, with six Catalan sites transitioning to 100% renewable el electricity sources. We already mentioned that the company now calculates 97% of its electricity usage across its global network um, being procured from re renewable energy sources, such as wind, solar, hydroelectric, and biomass. The report also highlighted the Catalan Cares Community Employee Giving and Volunteer Program, which was launched in fiscal year 2018. Earlier this month, Catalan was also recognized by the Top Employers Institute as a US and UK country certified top employer in 2022, which validates the company's uh, employee inclusion work Andrew highlighted in the last meeting. And the company's engagement with the city can be cultivated in the future to help us address a wide range of community issues including our housing challenges. While we recognize this kind of public-private partnership will take time to, deliver, to, to develop, the administration is committed to further engagement with Catalan and other major employers within the city, like IU, IU Health, MCCSC, Cook, and others, to help us provide more opportunities for workforce housing and other important community priorities. Calculating the exact effect of the abatement on short-term tax rates is complicated, 
That's because as we discussed in the last meeting, the levy is calculated separately from the assessed value. One investment stimulates other investments. The local economy is a complex and interdependent whole. And then we have a circuit breaker. There are a number of different variables that come into play. It's complicated stuff, not made easier by the Indiana legislature. As such, I'd like to spend some time working with council over the coming year to further educate ourselves and the public about the relationship between assessed value, tax rates, levies, and circuit breakers. In the meantime, what we have in front of us is a significant potential opportunity to leverage Catalan's future growth potential in Bloomington and possibly secure this consideration by Cat Catalan as it evaluates its growth. We ask you to confirm the resolution before you, which establishes the economic revitalization area and the recommended tax abatement. We ask you to build upon the past successes of this former Thompson site, increasing the returns of our past investments as a community since 1997, when Thompson left, abandoning 1,200 Bloomington-based workers, and to further build upon the successes we've seen. We ask that you help Bloomington as a whole, workers, especially manufacturing workers, small businesses, and people across the community to receive the broad benefits of this kind of growth to help more people to participate in our community's prosperity and to help us address our poverty challenges. And by su supporting the recommended abatement schedules, we ask you to position us as strongly as possible with minimum risk to our investment and with the ability to trust and verify that Catalan delivers against its commitments. Thank you for your consideration. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Crowley. I turn now to the council. Um, if I can see the entire council, I see the first hand up with um, council member Sims. Thank you, Mr. Crowley for the presentation. Um, not only now, but at the work session and at the committee meeting before all that. So, but thank you very much. Um, one of the things that you said earlier in your presentation and correct me if I mischaracterize anything that a yes vote by this council would indicate to other businesses the attractiveness of investing in our community. Did I pretty much capture that correctly? Yeah, I think that's right. Okay, um, and not trying to put words in your mouth, yeah. but, spe but specifically what I was wondering as part of that attractiveness um, and what it is that you do and other economic develop uh, orgs in our community how much does abatements figure into that attractiveness to outside businesses, if, if, if that makes sense? I mean, I know we're attractive, but are we gonna be only attractive if we do substantial abatements or more attractive? Is that part of the discussion? I'm sure when you are in administration are discussing with other businesses, possible investments. Yeah, so I think uh, that's a great question, uh, Councilmember Sims. I think uh, the answer is it depends, and I, um, which is it sort of depends on what the needs of the potential employer growth or you know arrival would be. In this particular case, um, Catalan's investment is so heavily skewed to uh, personal property, and that uh, given Indi how Indiana stacks up in some cases against other states, that is a particular. Uh, point of pain for them. Um, other employers, um, you know, I, I will give you an example. <laughs> uh, met with a with a it's a relatively smaller employer who is, um, um, you know, in a very niche market. And in fact, what they need need more than anything else is involvement with the Jacob School of Music. Um, so. You know, you 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 meet with people, and and different uh, organizations have very different needs. Some people are interested in coming to Bloomington because they are in current markets where their labor force is, uh, or, or you know, the 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 com competition for labor is so competitive that they are looking for places where they can increase their labor force without that level of of frenzy and competition. So I think the answer is it doesn't always require an abatement. In fact, in, in many cases, it doesn't. And But there are other strengths that we have a, a community, and it really comes down to the individual case uh, of what it is that that is um, causing you know, pain to that, uh, uh, that potential um, growth or, or investment. Okay, thank you. Um, 
and it may not come down to um, just abatements because um, I'm not so sure that we would approve a whole bunch of these going forward. Um, but I was more concerned about businesses outside of Bloomington that are looking at us and how big a part does the abatements play. Um, I guess uh, I guess we do want to work with, with companies that are interested, but I don't want to dangle a tax abatement unnecessarily so to enhance that attractiveness, if that makes sense. That does make sense. Yeah. And and look, we are very judicious in our use of abatements. Uh, you know, we, we have not come to you all that often with them. Uh, we are, um, you know, and, and there are a lot of strikes, as uh, you know, as I think I said uh, uh, earlier in, in, in the previous meeting, we, we, we stack up pretty well as a community, but there, you know, sometimes it is the difference. Um, and so we need to be prepared for those instances when it is. And we also don't want to, as you say, we don't want to, uh, you know, uh, put them on the table unnecessarily. Thank you. Thank you. I believe I saw a hand up from Council Member Rollo. Thank you, President Sandberg. Uh, first, Mr. Crowley, thanks for attending to our questions. I thought that was very thorough. Um, I, along the vein of judicious investment of public, public investment, um, one reason that uh, Thompson and Consumer Electronics was such a shock, economic shock and employment shock when it left was the sheer size of it. And that, you know, there was uh, the, this, you could see this across various communities, especially the Midwest, that were too dependent upon a particular economic sector. That is, um, they had a single large employer um, that when it left, it was an enormous vacuum to fill. I know that this is a targeted econ economic sector. I know that this company has performed very well in terms of returns on public investment. What do you think in terms of diversification of public investment within uh, various economic sectors to keep us from suffering that same fate, N number one? And number two, um, how does this sector perform during an economic downturn? So if we were to experience a recession, how would you anticipate this particular economic sector of biotechnology uh, to perform? Those are great questions, uh, Council Member Rollo. So let me address the first one. I can also maybe uh, ask uh, Andrew to talk a little bit more about durability in, in, uh, in downturns, but I can try to generally answer that. But the, the, um, the first question was about diversification. And I think that that's actually a really important uh, that's a really important point. The, you know, the the actually what was also shocking at the time of the Thompson loss was that we 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 actually had a couple of other pretty major manufacturers still still chugging along, uh, and and then they ultimately left. So you know it was even sort of a it's kind of the beginning of a domino effect. Um, diversification of of employers in in the city is really really important. You know, and if you're if you're a if you're talent, you know, and there's a lot of communities uh, competing for talent. If you're talent and you're looking at a, at a job, even if it's a job that's available in a community, inevitably you are asking yourself the question, what if this doesn't work out? And I've just picked up and moved to Bloomington and this job doesn't work out. What, what then, right? Um, and so one of the challenges that we've had uh, locally is that there just haven't really been all that many uh, significant um, job you know, major employers and, and even, you know, mid, mid sized employers. That's starting to change. We actually have increasingly some pretty strong players. A Catalan obviously is a, is a new entrant as of a couple of years ago. We have a Cook and IU and IU Health and, you know, and then they're also sort of that mid range employer base. And diversification is absolutely important to a community like us. Uh, because that does minimize risk. It minimizes risks of, of the kind of great vacuum of, of the disappearance of one company. Um, but it also creates opportunities for workers coming into town to come and stay and not just be tied to a single employment opportunity when that goes away, they would leave. So it's, it's, it's really great for talent attraction. Um, uh, I don't know if uh, Andrew or Grant would be willing to talk a little bit about um, about the second question, which uh, Councilmember Rollo was about the um, durability of, of this industry in, in economic downturns. 
Sure, I, I'll, I'll take that, Alex. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for the question, Councilman. Um, you know, Catalint has a, a very diversified offering and we see a very strong demand across all of the biologics mar uh, markets um, and, and much beyond the non-COVID programs. Uh, uh, Alex mentioned earlier that we do uh, manufacture to the, the COVID vaccines, but we're seeing considerable growth and demand um, across all of the biologic uh, sectors. So um, historically, I can't speak historically, but I can tell you today we, we are seeing a significant demand for the biologics that we, uh, we potentially can manufacture here in Bloomington. Thank you. I just oh. so just to confirm, I can see during an economic downturn, discretionary spending would would be hampered. But it seems to me, I mean, just from what I've been reading, that biologics have a pretty steady market. Yeah. yeah. Is that is that your conclusion? Is that you yeah. you've confirmed that? Yes, I would say that. And I've been in this business over 20 years, and we've seen some significant economic downturns in those 20 years. Um, and the the biologic sec sector um, is is a very strong sector, um, and the innovation Thank that's coming Thank out. You. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Rollo. I see a hand up from Councilmember Bowen. Thank you. Yeah, I, I want to uh, follow on the excellent questions of Councilmember Sims and Councilmember Rallo. Um, I don't believe that Councilmember Rallo got uh, an answer to his question about why, I mean, I'll, I'll restate it. Um, uh, how, why aren't we putting $3 million into 30 companies instead of one single company? I mean, companies start small, they grow. Cook started small, they grew, they grew, they grew big, they started diversifying uh, all over the country and the world. Uh, Cook, do they really need our help anymore? It's the, the companies that, for example, we funded during the, uh, the pandemic with the food and beverage tax. You know, we gave some of that money back to restaurants to stay open. Um, why, why aren't we looking for a bunch of smaller investments to make instead of one giant one? That's diversification. Yeah, well, and I and I think the answer to that, uh, Councilmember Bolin, and it's a good follow up, is that we are. Um, this is not. This is not the only. It's not a. You know, this is not the only card that uh, all of us, all of you, and 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 the city is is playing. Um, we are we are playing a multifaceted uh, game here, where, for example, um, you know, we put in uh, millions of dollars into the mill. And, and the purpose of that is to, to stimulate exactly what you're talking about. Startup, grow new companies from scratch. So we're that's, the, that's more of the kind of early stage play. Uh, we, are, uh, we, we successfully applied for and received um, uh, federal money to help us fund the, the uh, Trades District Technology Center, Center through the Economic Development Administration. That's more of a kind of next stage along, along the, the pipelines, that commercialization, so you can take some of that the seed companies and really try to blow them open into companies. We are uh, helping and supporting companies of all sizes in, in the city. We, you know, everybody from the envisages of the world to uh, much smaller companies, as you point out, you know, with, with things like the BUEA and our rapid response fund at the moment of crisis. Um, so there are a lot of different plays that are happening and we're, and we're playing all of them at the same time. So it's not just this. But this is a matter of degree. I mean, did all those investments together total thirty million dollars? I don't know that figure offhand, but but you know the, while, while we talk, you know certainly it is a matter of degree, and this is a huge opportunity. I don't think we can overstate the significance of this opportunity. So I do understand that that you know that that it's a that the tax abatement, the cumulative tax abatement, is a is a, is an eye popping number. So is the capital investment, and so are the job. So is the job growth. So. You know, you look at all of the stuff that's happening in the kind of early stage and and other aspects in the community. Adding a thousand jobs uh, is many, many, many cumulative efforts, uh, and and so it's not to say that we don't want that because we do, but I think we also want to take advantage of opportunities when they're presented this way. Well, uh, and I, I want to get to that in a later question, but just to finish on this this theme, uh, isn't it logical to assume that? 
the granting of one tax abatement only makes our community attractive to those companies seeking tax abatements. I mean, uh, Catalent has d demonstrated that they have expanded well beyond the initial commitment that uh, that Cook Pharmaca made, you know, 20 years ago. Now they have 3,200 employees here. They grew substantively. They doubled in size over, uh, I mean, combined the two companies in that location have doubled in size over the past uh, two decades. Uh, why don't we think that that growth is gonna happen anyway? I mean, they already have so much sunk cost here. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're thinking about investing here for a reason. Uh, I, I don't understand why we would feel the need to, to lure them when this is already a good place to do business. What, what do you say to that? Well, we don't have to lure them because they're here, to your point. Uh, right. we are, what we're luring is incremental capital investment. So they are here, but they're also in other locations. And, and you know, we have, we have benefits in this community. We also have, um, um, you know, we compete less well in other aspects. One of those aspects is, is taxation on personal property. So if we're trying to tip a scale and we're trying to encourage a, a very significant amount of capital investment and, you know, and job growth, associated job growth in our community, which I hope we all agree is a, is a, is a very strong and positive uh, development for us, then what we're trying to do is, is come up with a way to do that, to tip the scale in favor of Bloomington so we get that upside and we're able to take advantage not only of the jobs that are created on site at the facility, but all of the residual benefits that happen in the community as a result of this kind of growth. And as I said in the presentation, this is all interconnected. So the fact that Cat Catalan would be growing is going to help a startup in the mill and vice versa. The, you know, it's going to help a restaurant on Kirkwood. So, and all of this stuff all works together and, and isolating one particular decision point and stifling that or, or not encouraging it as, as thoroughly as we can starts to really break down that, that community benefit and, and overall. Growth. Mr. Crowley, the, the, there's also a price that's being paid lopsidedly by one particular sector, and that's residents, homeowners. The only uh, substantive tax on business in the state of Indiana anymore is the personal property tax. If we abate this much, it's going to wind up being paid by homeowners. And then we have circuit breakers. So, I mean, I don't like, I think there's a downside as well as an upside to it. And I agree with you that it's an interconnected, uh, you know, complicated whole, but we can, we do I can anticipate some negative. Uh, reactions as a result. I hope to keep that in mind. Well, yeah. I mean, I would like, clarify. I think you didn't mean to say this, but but real estate property, real property is also taxable uh, uh, on businesses, right? So so that so you you mentioned yes, but this is a this is a three hundred forty million dollar investment in personal property. Uh, right. The real estate the real estate investment is a, a drop in the bucket compared to what they're investing in equipment. Right. But on the flip side, the overall assessed value for the community is maybe 94% real property, 6% uh, uh, personal property. So in terms of just the overall uh, contribution of real property tax, um, you know, taxes paid, it's, it far outweighs uh, personal property. Um, but, you know, I think the other thing I would just, I would say is, uh, you know, not to um, assume that, the taxpayer will be, will bear the burden of the cumulative amount of the tax abatement. That that's where I think the article in today's paper maybe oversimplified things, and I think where we can all actually probably benefit from really delving into this over some time so we all understand it. But the, you know, the the the, it is not a one for one. You don't have a situation where you have catalan getting an abatement and therefore someone's taxes will go necessarily. Uh, up or down as a result of that, it's there's an overall uh, of, you know uh, effect that's happening throughout the community of which this is a frankly you know relatively a small part. Uh, are are you trying to claim that no one is going to like this is a a cost free benefit that there's no downside to the community in any way to give this abatement? I am saying that it is such a positive. Uh, effect on the community directly and indirectly 
uh, which goes beyond just tax revenue calculations, but including tax revenue calculations, that it is a significant, uh, significantly positive uh, a step for us and something that we absolutely want to try to do everything we can to attract. Thank and you. if I could suggest we move on in the first round, if there are additional questions from council members that we could entertain at this time before we move on to uh, a second round. Council member Flaherty. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Carly, for the presentation. Um, I appreciate uh, endeavoring to answer questions we raised last week or two weeks ago. Um, and agree with a lot of what's been said um, with regard to the, the desirability of this expansion, of course. Um, I mentioned two weeks ago, and, and one area I'm still struggling is uh, how to square the, the facts we have with the statutory guidance or requirements. So I'm just going to uh, quote verbatim from uh, Indiana Code. Uh, an economic revitalization area means an area which is within the corporate limits of a city, town, or county which has become under, undesirable for or impossible of normal development and occupancy because of a lack of development, cessation of growth, deterioration of improvements or character of occupancy, age, obsolescence, substandard buildings, or other factors which have impaired values or prevent a normal development of property or use of property. And end quote. I'm struggling. I, I don't feel like that case has been made here. I've heard a lot of reasons why um, Catalan is a great employer, why uh, job gr you know, growth and good wages are, of course, good things that all of us want. I don't think anyone would disagree with any of the benefits that have been uh, uh, sort of shared, but I'm, I'm struggling with the actual statutory guidance as you know, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the case that has been made. Um, I, I, I just haven't seen it. So I guess I'm asking how you how you feel like uh, beyond all the benefits we've talked about with good wages, job growth, um, et cetera, uh, why this property uh, justifies the creation of an ERA within the the guidance of Indiana Code that it's uh, um, you know undesirable or impossible of normal development because I just feel like that case hasn't been made. Right, or other factors, right? And so, you know, I think just speaking to that particular element, you know, you do have to recognize that there are a number of different parcels here that, that are incorporated here, some, some of which are really underdeveloped and or not developed at all, um, have been stagnant since the departure of, of uh, um, Catalan, or I'm, I'm sorry, of uh, Thompson, and really do need to, to you know, some, some effort to get them moving. We have had success, and I, I really, you know, pay tribute to everybody back in 2000, 97, all of that time, and all the way through the years who, who preceded me and, and us that uh, really kind of focused to try to get this activated and have had some success, but not, you know, th this is, th there's still a lot of work to do, and there's still a lot of potential and expansion to do. So in terms of just the lack of development, you do have to look around and say, well, there's a lot of stuff that hasn't yet been developed here, and we, gotta, we, we need to try to get that reactivated in a way that used to be pretty vibrant. Um, so, you know, I think, I think that that's basically how I think about it. And I, um, you know, I, I know that, um, you know, there, there's a lot of upside still ahead in this particular area. And I, you know, we're, we're basically trying to build on the, on the, you know, the history of what's already been done to get us to where we want to be in this area. Can I follow up, Madam President? Sure. Um, so to clarify the, the other factors, uh, portion of that, um, text applies to the reasons why it's become undesirable for or impossible of growth. Um, so there's a, a whole host of reasons, including quote unquote other factors, why something could be impossible or, or undesirable for growth. And I, I guess um, it, it, it just doesn't seem to be the case that, that, that it's impossible for, for growth to occur here. Um, and I guess uh, what I'm looking for still is some sort of uh, financial justification or explanation from Catalan as to why this is necessary, why this expansion could not occur without this abatement. I understand that they'd like an abatement, everybody would like to pay less taxes, but I have seen no explanation why specifically $30 million in abatement is needed to uh, as, as a condition for expansion as opposed to simply something we'd like or, or something that makes us more competitive, which is not, not the question we're answering. Is there any any additional detail to add to justify um, 
Oh, I thought I could start, Andrew. I don't know if you want to jump in, but uh, let me sure. start. And uh, you know what we heard at the last meeting uh, was cert from Catalan and from their representatives the uh, competitive disadvantage that we have relative to this uh, to the personal property, um, you know, liabilities. That is a significant uh, pain point, and so that is something that you know. Again, we are trying, we are working and trying to listen to them, and we've been working with them for six plus months to understand what it is that, that you know, can help stimulate this, what it is that's preventing it, what it is that would make us a, a more desirable location for this kind of investment and jobs. And, um, you know, that is very much um, mm -hmm. uh, an issue that they are, they are challenged with. So that, that's, you know, financially um, uh, a real, uh, you know, cost issue for them. And Andrew, I don't know if you want to jump in and and yeah, speak. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and and I I believe I mentioned this two weeks ago and thank you again for everybody's you know time. Um, we are as I mentioned, we are in our strategic planning process, and um, all of the sites uh, are competing for um, the volume, and we are required to put together financial packages. Um, that that will show Catalan the the viability of growth in a particular location, um, and that's why this abatement um, would help us in that venture. Um, so that's that's where we're at. Is we are competing with other communities, other cities in the U.S. and around the globe for growth opportunities, and I'm committed um, to helping to grow our business here in Bloomington. I really appreciate that. Thank you. And the financial package that you develop, I mean, do you model multiple scenarios? And have you compared a with abatement and without abatement scenario? And can you tell us like what the difference in an expected return on investment is in those two scenarios? That's the type of justification I'm I'm asking about, I guess, that I feel like I haven't seen. Understood. Uh, we, we do certain models uh, for our uh, strategic planning. Um, I don't have those numbers in front of me right now to say this, this scenario includes this, this scenario includes that. Um, but, you know, if, if we don't uh, get the abatements, you know, my leadership team and the corporate leadership team, we have to go back, uh, look at the, look at the models that we have put together um, and reevaluate our options um, for the, the, the much needed capacity that we need as an organization across the globe. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Additional first round questions from council members. Not seeing any new hands popping up. So any council members who have already asked a question who have another. Council member Bolin and then council Thank member Bolin. Yeah, um, I wanted to again, follow up on uh, some questions that have been asked since I asked mine. Um, how can we even say there's been a lack of development? I mean, if we lost 1,200 jobs 25 years ago when Thompson left, well, there are 3,200 jobs now. The investment we made in 2004 paid off, and it made sense in 2003, 2004 when we when we invested in uh, Cook Pharmaca, uh, and you know, like Catalan has shown uh, how they can uh, they they made that business make even more sense once Cook had built it up. Um, so like, how is that a lack of development? And meanwhile, we talk about the, the personal property tax being a pain point, but the mayor has touted extensively the low tax nature of the county and in, in coming to us to ask for uh, additional uh, local option income taxes. We have one of the lowest tax burdens in the state. This is something that I, I'd say he's fairly bragged about. So how can this be such a pain point, uh, the personal property tax, that we have to abate it in such a dramatic way? I mean, are, isn't the burden on cattle and the tax burden already competitively low? So uh, let me try to answer that, Council Member Vol. And I think- It's really two questions. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, no, that's okay. So. Uh, in the in the in the second instance, <clears throat> I mean, I think you know, uh, just just to clarify the the local income tax and real estate tax, you know, obviously it's sort of two different things. And and 
um, you sure. know, discussions about the lit. So, so I mean, I think that we, we just need to separate those out a little bit. Uh, we're also not competing with uh, other Indiana counties, right? We're we're not competing with um, uh, other places in the state. We're actually competing out of state. So it's a slightly different uh, calculation, or, or I should say, it's you know, in this particular case, it's 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 a different competitive set than um, you know than a comparison set of how we stack up against other counties in the state. Um, and to your first point, you know, I you know I I'm not I'm not sure that. I think your question is, you know, because there's been so much growth, how can we say, um, why aren't we saying, you know, enough is enough? No, that's and not what I said. I'm sorry. I should clarify. I was following up on Councilmember Flaherty's point that the statute calls for, you know, renewal of underdeveloped places. And it's hard to argue that the Thompson property is underdeveloped anymore. I mean, you've, you've said that there are certain properties that have yet to have be built on uh, or yet to be redeveloped. But I mean, already it's been a smashing success. No one looks at the old Thompson site and says, this is a decrepit, falling down, abandoned, neglected place. It was that for 10, 15 years, even as Cook Pharmaca was building up. But you, you can't say that it's uh, Gary or Muncie anymore. So how do you, how do you square that circle? Well, I think you need to take the area, look at the area as a whole, look at all of the all the parcels that we're putting, you know, into this discussion. And and you know, I think they're different. They're actually different stories with different parcels, right? So certainly the the Catalan building itself, which is where it is right now, um, has seen some 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 life breathe back into it. Um, and and then and then there are areas around it that have. And so you know, we really want to. We think that this area. Is really has a lot of potential to do a lot of great things for our um, employment base, and and it just you know it's it's getting there. It's uh, you know it's definitely advancing, but I think there's a lot more work that has to be done there to 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 optimize it, and that's what we're trying to do. Um, so well, just go ahead. So I mean, so I would point to you know some of the land that's been lying fallow since since the you know the Thompson departure and and say you know why right why well, is that. that yeah, like, like that's the next. That's the follow-up I'd like to ask. Some of the land that they're looking to build on isn't that land that has been held by the county for decades. Uh, it has, and and but it also has been sort of under undeveloped, right? Right. But, but I mean, the county had held it for a long time because they were thinking about building a new government complex there, and the the it just fell through. But I mean, that's not the fault of the. I mean that that uh, no no business can be blame for deciding not to locate in property that was held by county government for until just now. Only now are they deciding that they are willing to let it go to a private developer, which is great, but you can't say that that's um, a justification because it was undeveloped by the county. Can you? Well, look, I, I you know, if, if now is any indication the county is interested in, uh, you know, is interested in the potential sale of that property, right? Um, now, I, I honestly, I've not, I have not been here long enough to understand the full history prior to, sure. you know, to my arrival, so I can't really speak to that as clearly as as I as I would like. But I do know that the county is very eager, you know, with the right price and the right right deal and right growth prospects to 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 um, have that yeah. land redeveloped. Right? Yeah, I, I don't have a problem with that. It's just that uh, it was in government hands directly to redevelop it. And it's not like private industry was uh, pining to develop that land uh, until the county decided they didn't want to build it anymore. So, I mean, like, that's not a justification for the statute that Council of Flaherty cited where we're looking at, I mean, there was the, the properties that do fit that standard in your estimation, I think are significantly fewer than when you count all those the acreage from that county land. And if we well, need, yeah. oh, sorry, ahead. Mr. Crowley, do you have a response to that before we move on to another question? Yeah, I mean, I think all I would say is that, you know, I just, I can't speak to what kind of offers they would have received even while they were holding it for potentially other purposes. Um, you know, I, I would imagine that if, you know, the right offer had come forward, I, I suspect, you know, as right. we are, as we do, they would have sold that land and it just hasn't. So sure. you know, I don't know, I can't, I, I really can't speak to, to what's happened in the background there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and I believe Mr. Councilmember Rollo had a question. Second round. Yes, I do. Thank you. 
And, and maybe we could clarify a bit, uh, Councilmember Volan spoke to, formerly we had 1,200 jobs there that then left and then we have 3,200 now, but I think it was the last phase of job flight from the community was over 1,000 jobs, but formerly there had been far more. Um, and of course, this is a targeted area for us for, as an employment center that we've had for decades now, and we've had great success. But my question is, about, and this is, you know, I don't expect precise numbers here, Mr. Crowley or Mr. Espeo, but just a thumbnail. So we discovered last time, we discussed that this would be over a thousand jobs uh, added to the employment. Um, we uh, discussed that about half of those would be living within the county, half of those would be um, commuters from outside. Um, I do appreciate that because I think that we are a regional employment center, so it is important. Um, but how many of the jobs would be filled by existing residents now, and how many would be filled by immigrants from somewhere else, from elsewhere in Indiana or neighboring states or across the country or, or that sort of thing? Um, I'm, I'm just curious about serving the community benefit of this investment serving existing residents now, and I could could you address that? I, I'll I'll take a, to take a stab at that, Alex, if that's okay. And thank you again, Councilman um, Rollo, for your question. I can't predict where people are going to come from, I, and, and we're roughly fifty two percent within the county, forty eight percent out. So you know, fifty fifty. Um, could that change heavily? I can't predict that, but we do target. Um, people in our area, talent in our area. Um, and, and that has been our, our, our process going forward to try to attract local talent. Um, that's what we prefer. I, it'd be very difficult for me to say where, where I, to me to predict where those, those talent will come from. Could you tell us just on the basis historically where they've come from? Yeah, 52% are coming from within Monroe County, 48% are coming from outside Monroe County. Well, that's where they live now, but does, or, or in terms of job applicants, is that your experience? I mean, you know, I, I know that, for instance, yeah. Ivy Tech is are training people in, in bio, biotechnology, right. and obviously IU has, is training people uh, in, in biology and biotechnology and microbiology and so forth that would be applicable. There are also less technical positions that would be filled. Uh, because this is a range of skill sets that um, that you're going to be employing. And so um, could you venture a guess in terms of how many existing residents in Monroe County or South Central Indiana would be working at your facility? Again, I, it would be very difficult for me to predict where they were coming from. I don't have the data of where okay. our colleagues came from. I can tell you what I know is where they live today. And I, I don't okay. have that data to tell you where, if they relocated from somewhere else. Yes, I, I appreciate that. It's, it's a question that I probably should have issued earlier. Uh, Mr. Crowley, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, not really. I mean, I, obviously, I don't have a lot of visibility into the details of, of uh, you know, of, of the, uh, of the origination, I think, is what you're asking for from for a worker, regardless of where they ended up regionally, right? And whether or not they're coming from out of state or at, out of you know further away, um, you know, I think what's important to us as we look at it is we, we do want to provide opportunities for the local population. Um, you know, I think as I was talking about the wage growth issue that we've had, uh, what you, we we want to create avenues for people who are maybe in jobs that have lower wages to have jobs that are, have, have higher wages. That's good for them. It's good for everyone. And uh, the more we can do that, the better. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm encouraged to hear um, that Catalan does uh, focus locally because I think that, that that does provide, you know, presumably someone is, you know, joining the, the Catalan workforce to, to improve their, their um, prospects. And so, you know, that, that's encouraging for me to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional council questions in the second round before we move on to public comment? We can certainly come back to questions after public comment. Any second round? All right. Not seeing any. Um, 
Mr. Lucas, again, can we just restate that the public comment that's about to commence will be an important part of this, this process? Yes, uh, for members of the public that would like to comment, uh, please use the raise hand function to do so. You can find that feature under the uh, reactions tab or the more tab in your control bar. And if you're not able to locate it, please send a message via chat uh, to the meeting host. And uh, I will note again that the public comment period on this item serves as the statutorily required public hearing on uh, the confirmatory resolution. And I do see several hands uh, raised. Yes, thank you. Would we need to set a time limit of three minutes? Does that sound like fair for the amount of hands that are up this evening? I see seven yeah. hands raised at the moment. Yeah, I, I think let's go ahead and establish three minutes as a fair amount of time for a public comment. And if you wouldn't mind calling on who you saw first, raise a hand. Thank yes. you. Yes, first up is the BEDC. Welcome, you may unmute and you have three minutes. All right, thank you so much. My name is Jen Pearl and I'm the president of the Bloomington Economic Development Corporation, which is a nonprofit that um, works on economic development for our community. Um, thank you to the city council members for considering the proposal. Um, we've worked with Catalent to support job growth and investment in the community for the past several years. We appreciate our ongoing collaboration with the city team and we appreciate Catalan for considering the significant investment. Uh, as noted in the last meeting, the BDC supports the abatement for four main reasons. One is that economic development works to create conditions for prosperity for our neighbors, which includes wage growth, which is shown here. Second is the proposed expansion has a much broader economic impact through tax contributions from Catalan, income taxes, increased local spending, um, companies that do business with Catalan and even sales taxes. Third is the proposed expansion not only leads to direct jobs, but indirect jobs through local companies that do business with Catalan. And fourth is that this raises our community's profile in life sciences, which is a key industry in our local economy. Um, we also wanted to touch on some of the questions that we heard about this project. Uh, regarding concerns about things like housing, we have an opportunity to come together as a community across sectors to address some of the questions that have been raised. Uh, that's happening through efforts like those housing developments noted by Alex Crowley with more opportunity to come. Second, regarding the labor market, um, while competition can be challenging, movement of workers across the market simultaneously drives up wages and enables the workforce to upskill. It creates a thicker labor market, which is attractive for individuals that are locating here for work. And it shows that our community offers an array of quality employment options, which is often cited as a benefit in larger cities when it comes to talent attraction and retention. And this helps to diversify employment across our local companies. Regarding Catalan's engagement with the community, we've had deepening engagement with the Catalan team um, started earlier with Mr. Grant Eccles, and even more so when Mr. Andrew Espejo came on board a few months ago. And we're quite excited um, to cultivate more public-private partnership moving forward. Um, so in short, for almost 25 years, the city's investments in this parcel have had a significant return for the economy and for the local community. This is an investment that adds to future vitality of the community while growing the overall pie for our economy. Thank you so much for considering this proposal. Thank you, Ms. Pearl. And next we have. Next up is uh, Joseph Wainia. You may unmute and you have three minutes. Hello, thank you. This is Joseph Wainia. Um, I wanted to say that I attended the February 16th Common Council meeting in which you know included the deliberation on resolution 2205. And after watching the presentation and listening to the questions from council, I couldn't help noticing that there was one particularly important question that I didn't see considered. And that is how much longer do we want to couple ourselves in this community to this type of conventional economic activity? Because in the face of a destabilizing climate, a crashing planetary ecosystem and dwindling energy and resources, should we be bringing in more of the same thing that has been driving these for the last century? Now, I absolutely understand the appeal of this particular opportunity and that in the context of the last 100 years, it would look like a really good fit. 
But given the current planetary circumstances, I think we're in a completely different reality and really can't continue to do this kind of business as usual. And in particular, the very reports that are tracking and warning us of these cascading unfolding disasters also strongly correlate economic activity and the current levels of consumption to this environmental destruction. Every investment made to improve the quality of life now through this economic model is degrading the quality of life in the very near future and accelerating how quickly that future will arrive. And to make this point what I think is uncomfortably clear, this resolution is to confirm a 20-year tax abatement. And according to the World Wildlife Fund for Nature's 2020 Living Planet Report, the global vertebrate wildlife population has declined 70% from 1970 to 2016. If this trend continues, there will be zero vertebrate wildlife in 17 years. In that same time, the global economy has increased fourfold and global trade tenfold. This is a model of living that simply cannot persist and to put our faith in it is to build our future on what I think is a house of cards. If we aren't careful, we're going to ride a high paying jobs train straight off a cliff and we can't decide once we're in free fall that we want to do things differently. I, I don't want to see a Bloomington that yokes itself to a failing system in the face of impending hardship and then suffer even greater calamity as a result. I fear that we're so focused on avoiding a future with a collapsed economy that we aren't focused enough on avoiding a future with a collapsed biosphere. And I assure you the latter will be worse. And I, again, I realize that this is one of the most complicated and difficult components of confronting our planetary crises because of how deeply entrenched it is and how far reaching its impacts are. But that is precisely why it's so important that we begin having this conversation now as early as we possibly can. So knowing the many factors involved in this decision, I'm not going to encourage or ask the council to take a particular stance on this resolution, but I do want to ask council, the Department of ESD, and frankly, anyone watching to give this question and these remarks serious consideration in this decision and in all future decisions of its kind. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rainier. And next. Next up is uh, Cindy Kinarney. Thank you, Ms. Kinarney. You may unmute and you have three minutes. Good evening, I'm Cindy Kinarney. I'd like to thank the council for all your time and effort spent considering this great opportunity for our community. This is an exciting opportunity for not only today, but also the future of our community. A vibrant local economy benefits everyone to include local businesses of all kinds. Catalan's benefit has already been felt by the local business community and it's been pretty widespread. This community investment will continue to position our community as one, of, one that embraces economic growth, opportunities that benefit our current citizens and businesses and future generations, bringing additional business opportunities. I wear many hats, but the most important one is that of a mom. And my hope for our community continues to be a vibrant local economy where all of our kids can find opportunities to grow their futures right here in Bloomington and Monroe County. And for those reasons, I support the proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kamarani. Next is Eric Spoonmore. Thank you. Thank you, Council, uh, for the opportunity to speak this evening. I'm Eric Spoonmore, President the Greater Bloomington Chamber of Commerce and appreciate uh, being able to share our perspective uh, with you tonight. The Chamber uh, has consistently supported uh, federal, state, local economic initiatives uh, and incentives that work to grow jobs, wages, and business expansion. This would include the use of local tax abatements and other incentives that promote economic development and job creation here in Greater uh, Bloomington. And uh, we have seen uh, a lot of uh, successful examples of these types of incentives being applied here in our community, which the chamber is supporting. As I mentioned, uh, we're excited for the prospect of substantial job growth, increased capital investment and higher wages. And we support the use of uh, economic development tools to achieve those outcomes. And uh, fortunately here in Indiana, we've uh, traditionally done very well with attracting the types of jobs and investments that are not susceptible to the new remote working trends and 
uh, we believe this will be another important consideration, especially now as we think strategically about the long-term health and sustainability of our local and uh, state economy. And having said that, we also recognize that this uh, particular abatement is unprecedented in terms of its uh, duration and dollar amount here in our community at least. So in light of the huge public investment that's being considered here, we just want to reiterate that we think it's very important that our city officials uh, make every effort to protect the long-term future of the community through appropriately designed incentives and uh, clawbacks and performance metrics that are tied back to these kinds of uh, abatements. And also, I think it's important to recognize uh, that some of our ongoing challenges related to housing availability and infrastructure aren't mitigated by awarding tax abatements. And these kinds of things uh, will need to be a priority for public sector leaders to really ensure uh, the long-term quality of life we want for uh, Bloomington and Monroe County. And then finally, uh, as I mentioned before, we're, we're really excited about the prospect of growth that can come from these abatements and various economic development tools. And uh, we would just encourage any recipients of such incentives to really partner with the larger community and engage in ways that are reflective of the tremendous public investments that are being made for their projects. And you know, for a community to really thrive and be successful, it takes all of us to be working together as a team. And uh, so we feel that taking these collective steps will position us best for uh, long-term success as a community. And I know we all want that. So thank you uh, all very much uh, again for the opportunity to speak here. Appreciate all the work uh, that you put into this stuff and uh, have a great evening. Thank you, Mr. Spumar. Next is Ariana Gunderson. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Ariana Gunderson and I urge you to oppose this tax abatement. I am astonished that the city would invest so much money into the profits of a company um, instead of into its people. And I fear that being a company town is a really good situation for a company, but not for a town. And um, I am surprised to hear this plan after the mayor's town of the city address where he indicated interest in raising income tax. So if the city is looking for um, more funds, I don't know why uh, the city would move forward with this abatement, which would benefit really significantly one single company. So I urge you to oppose it. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Jeff McKim. Good evening, my name is Jeff McKim and I serve on the Monroe County Council as well as the Economic Development Commission that made a recommendation in favor of this abatement. I wanted to speak briefly in support of tonight's confirmatory resolution, of course, speaking only as myself. Uh, first, I understand the concern about the 20 year abatement, the first use of such an abatement in our community. However, that component of the abatement is entirely on business personal property, a class of assessed value that does not significantly add to the demand for local government services. Further, it's likely that the General Assembly will be radically restructuring these kinds of taxes, not this in this short session, but soon, making the impact of this part of the abatement potentially largely moot. And give, but given the scale of the investment and the growing importance of this industry forming the basis of economic stability in our community, I think if there's ever an appropriate use of the extended abatement, this project is it. Second, as elected officials, how many times have we and our constituents expressed concern about wages in Bloomington? Of course, we can't simply decree that wages be increased. The best way to raise wages in the area, which I think we all agree we want, is to support the creation of jobs that pay higher wages. These jobs not only pay higher wages themselves, but also create upward competitive pressure on wages for other jobs in the area. This is exactly how we raise wages. Look, I don't want to oversell the value of abatements in general. We've already heard discussion tonight, the gist of which is that tax abatements and tax climate in general is only one factor of many that companies look at in site selection. But it is one factor that the law does give local government the ability to control. It's the one lever we have. And it at least allows us to level the playing field against other communities that can and do provide tax benefits that are at least as generous, if not more so, than the incentives being offered here. And remember that even with this abatement, we'll still be seeing additional property taxes paid by Catalan versus the status quo without the investment. 
So in conclusion, I just want to say that as a county elected official, I welcome this investment from Catalent and I urge my city colleagues to support it as well. Thank you very much for listening to these comments tonight. Thank you, Mr. McCann. Next up. Next, <clears throat> next is John Fernandez. Great, thank you. Um, uh, good evening, uh, members of the city council. I, I gotta say, I really appreciate Jeff McKim's comments. Uh, they were so spot on. Uh, what I wanted to do is maybe provide a little broader context for what's in front of the council tonight. Um, you know, when we think about the, the amount of job creation here in the manufacturing sector, we need to broaden the lens to think a little bit more historically about where we are today relative to where we've been. Um, you know, when Thompson closed, that certainly was a large shock to our community. Uh, we lost 1,200 uh, jobs. Uh, but since Thompson closed, they weren't the only one that left. Uh, we lost General Electric, we lost ABB, we lost Otis Elevator. And I say that because I think the point tonight that I want to emphasize is that this decision isn't so much about Catalan. It's about creating economic opportunities for our community, for people in our community who are at risk of being left behind in an ever-changing dynamic economy. Uh, Alex presented some excellent data on uh, the rapid, uh, or I guess the discrepancy in wage growth between different sectors. All across the board, Bloomington historically has lagged behind national averages in wages in almost every single job class, bar none certainly in manufacturing. It's only recently that we've seen some positive movement in this segment of our economy. And I would argue that the reason we're seeing that, that movement is because there's now more competition for employees. And that's a really good thing for our people. I certainly appreciate the challenges that creates for employers. Uh, I live in a world where I help run a large enterprise that is in a massive talent war. I get it. Uh, but for the city council, I really want to focus on the people that this could positively impact. Our economy has changed so much that Bloomington is at risk of having very much a have and have nots environment. We see professional class jobs growing at a significant higher wage growth than we do uh, for less skilled jobs. Uh, this is a great opportunity uh, to continue this positive momentum, to create good paying opportunities uh, for people in our community. Does it create challenges? Yes. I think a lot of the challenges we've heard about in terms of housing, transportation, et cetera, require public-private partnerships to advance. And Catalan, in my view, will be a very good public partner in those uh, challenges and how we try to address them in the future. So I would certainly encourage the city council to vote in favor of this resolution and let's move forward uh, to a new era where our people have some great opportunities to have living wages and to build the kind of lives they want for their families. Thank you. And next. Yes, next and I believe last is Jeff uh, Weslich. Weslich, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that. Yeah, you did an excellent job. Um, so thank you. It's, it's rare. Uh, this is Jeff Wilslich from Cardinal Spirits. We're uh, Bloomington's oldest and only distillery. Uh, we're located not far, actually, from Catalan. And I would just urge uh, that the city council uh, support this uh, abatement and this resolution. Uh, as a small business owner with over 70 employees, I've seen firsthand the positive benefits of Catalan in our community. Uh, one thing to talk about, um, especially based on a public opinion or a comment from earlier, is they are a growing and vibrant uh, employer that is close to downtown, which is really rare. Um, this location even allows uh, some of their employees to bike to work, which is uh, so powerful. A number of our employees bike to work, and um, as we've been looking for new location, it seems like most manufacturing is out on the west side, and that makes it a real challenge uh, to have um, those that want to walk or bike to work. And, and I'm so pleased that Catalan is so close to downtown and that that is an opportunity. You know, as others have said, their entry level positions are high paying. In fact, we've had to increase um, our starting wages to be competitive. And even as a business owner, you might think that's a, a detriment. I, I felt good about it. I felt that we needed to rebalance and become a part of the community and make sure that 
Well, I felt like we were a part of the community, but I felt like we needed to be competitive in the community for wages uh, based on what Catalan was paying. And I've heard anecdotally from others, um, other employers that they've had to do the same thing. Um, I have some special insight into Catalan, and uh, that's because we've hired away two managers from there. Uh, they had felt like they wanted to work at a smaller company or a different company, and so we've gotten to employ two of our most senior positions that we filled recently have come from Catalan. And it was really great to have um, another employer in the community that we could you know, kind of recruit from, not that we were poaching, but that they had been trained by Catalan, gone through the programs. I also got to hear a lot about their DEI initiatives. Uh, they were very much in line with the values of Bloomington, which I felt good about, and hear about their sustainability issues um, and their great track record on that. You know, and as somebody who's been in Bloomington for 25 years, I've started a business here, employ a number of people, also have a, a family and recruited people to the area, both um, for work and just for social purposes. Um, and I like to serve and help out the community in a number of ways. I'm always anxious about our reputation in the broader community. Um, when I travel around the state or around the country and I talk about some of the challenges we have here about growing our existing businesses, there are challenges and those are realities compared to our peers. And even though I know that this is a great place to have a family, to raise a family and to at times uh, have business, it's still a challenge to do that here. And, um, and a Mr. lot of times these decisions are made in boardrooms far away. So we anyway, I urge support comment. and thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Mr. Lucas, I see no additional hands. Are you seeing anything in chat or anyone else who wishes to comment this evening? No, that's all I see at the moment. All right. Again, this concludes the public hearing portion of this resolution. And so at this point, let us move back to council for either additional questions that may have come up after the public comment period or any final comment. I see a hand up from, um, let's see, council member Rollo, I believe. Is it appropriate for comments? I'll defer to anyone who has questions. Does anyone have a question first before we move to final comment? Uh, would that be you, Council Member Bolin? You have a hand up? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, in the in passing, it was mentioned that uh, Catalan is working with ESD on uh, the new TDM program. Uh, can we get some detail on what that program is? Yeah, TDM I mean, program. It, yes. So, uh, if you recall, uh, Councilmember Volan, the TDM plan that was put that was adopted back in 2019, um, you know, laid out a, a variety of different recommendations. What we are doing uh, right now for that plan is really building a platform and a program. And what that means is um, that it will involve um, a, a sort of program, literally a, a software program. Uh, furnished by Ride Amigos, which has a, a Bloomington office and Bloomington history, um, and um, and serves an, uh, hundreds of of other cities. And what that what that program effectively does is allow for people to um, more easily um, essentially connect with non single occupancy vehicle travel options, whether that's you know layers that involve the bus system, layers that involve the you know scooters, or layers that involve uh, carpooling and other, other uh, you know, van pooling, that sort of thing. So it becomes a kind of centralized um, individual tool for um, non-single occupancy, single occupancy vehicle travel. What we'll do is wrap around that a, a marketing program, um, a branding program, and then also, as I noted in, in my presentation, uh, we're gonna rely heavily on partnerships uh, in, in the private sector to help get the word out. So, so the fact that Catalan is uh, uh, committed to doing that, and they've done so formally, uh, allows us a, a, a way to access one of, one of the more significant um, employers and, and have access to the employee base. So we're looking for ways that, that um, you know, we can leverage what we already have planned and also build other ideas. But you, know, you could imagine, for example, that if there are a bunch of workers coming from Bedford that go work at the, at the Catalan facility, and they don't want to drive their their cars individually every day. 
and are looking for options, this platform, this program, and access to them becomes uh, a way that we can connect them for like fan pooling uh, or carpooling and, and other, other ways of, of um, managing their, their transportation. Okay, will there be, what kind of metrics will come out of this program so that we can see how it's doing? Well, some- Especially early, with Catalan. Yeah, I mean, I think early, early metrics are gonna really rely on engagement, uh, sort of in, you know, the, the end user engagement levels and, and making sure that we maximize those. And then, and then what are people doing, right? And it, it sort of gamifies a little bit the, the, um, you know, the, the transportation decisions you make. So you can also then judge how people are actually changing their behavior. So there's there's some you know some of those metrics, well, and then we'll we'll obviously be looking at um, ultimately uh, you know data that that may point to a decrease in single occupancy vehicle travel. I've got another question, but I'll uh, hold it for anybody else. Thank you. Any additional questions from council before we move to final comments? Not seeing any hands up for questions, so go ahead, Mr. Roland. Okay, this is my I think my last question. Uh, basically. Um, so we've talked about how we want to create opportunities for the local population, uh, but how do we know that we're actually doing so? I mean, this is a, a follow-up to several other questions asked a different way, but I mean, uh, surely Catalan knows, they, they, they already know that 48% of their employee base doesn't live in Monroe County. So they have some idea of where they're employees are now, but uh, their HR should at least, I mean, they get resumes from people and those people have current addresses. Can we get from Catalan uh, the number of people who get hired by them who are being hired from outside Monroe County? Yeah, I, I would imagine that they have that data. I, uh, you know, I think as, as, um, as they've said this evening, they, they didn't have it readily available. Uh, certainly we can work with them and see if we can get underneath that a little bit more uh, to understand. I think what you're asking is where does someone originate? Where, where, what's the address on their revenue when they apply for a resume, when they apply for a job? And then, so, so somewhat regardless, but but then to, to a secondary degree, where do they land once they've gotten it, right? And and so, right. yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I think it's, it's, a, it's a stimulating question. I think uh, it'd be interesting to understand um, Unfortunately, you know, we, we, we didn't have the ability to do so this evening. Well, okay, it's not a matter of doing so. Is, will, is Catalan willing to do so? Mr. Espego, I see, is uh, ready to speak. I'd love to hear from him. I will check with our HR department to see if we have that, that data uh, uh, relatively available for us to look at. Uh, it, it would be great if you have it already, but if you don't have it, would you be willing to collect it just so that we can learn from this exchange? I will take that back to my HR department to see how, if we don't have it, how we could get it. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. On to council comments now, I believe. And council member Rollo, did you wish to make a comment? Yes, I would. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks for all the good uh, public input. I really appreciated everyone speaking out. Um, many good comments this evening to consider. Um, and I appreciate my colleagues' questions as well. I think that uh, these are, it's, it's appropriate to scrutinize this uh, public investment. Um, it is, requires careful examination. And I appreciate Mr. Crowley and uh, Mr. Espeo uh, responding to the council's inquiry. Um, there's a lot to consider here and I've been thinking about it for the last a couple of weeks, and um, I think it really is a matter of balance because there are good points to be made on, on all sides. And uh, I'll, I'll begin with Mr. Uh, Wenia's comments, which I think are, are very appropriate. And that is, what kind of economic development do we expect in the future in order to um, meet the challenges in terms of our impact, of the human footprint on ecological systems? And uh, I consider that as a, as a real priority. And, but it, I, I also need to consider it not in a vacuum as well. And I need to consider about, uh, in terms of economic investment in, in this community that enhances human well being and um, is, uh, creates the means by which we could may, uh, attain a, a circular economy for Bloomington. Now, that, that 
that's a long way off, but I've been an advocate for, for instance, uh, local agriculture, because the agricultural sector is extremely hard on our environment, requires a lot of land. Um, the corporate model farming is terribly destructive to soils, water use, and so forth. And it, the transportation it requires is very carbon intensive. So it's appropriate to focus on local agriculture, for instance, because we have that ability in our community and outside. And I credit uh, Mr. Crowley for being uh, very attentive to that and working to uh, develop that. Uh, it's in its infancy, but I think that we've been serious about it. Um, now, in terms of this particular economic sector, I think that it is rather uh, has a soft impact in terms of its ecological impact. Um, it's not an extractive industry; doesn't require tremendous amounts of um, uh, doesn't produce pollutants, tremendous amounts of pollutants. Uh, it enhances human well-being in terms of the biologics that it produces, or at least on balance it does. Uh, I've looked at the uh, corporate uh, commitment to carbon reduction, and I appreciate what they're doing by reducing carbon emissions 15% by 2023. Um, so I'm, it's, I think the point is well taken, and I think that's something we do need to consider, and ESD needs to consider. And in fact, um, I'm suspicious of the uh, claim and Council Member Piedmont Smith said this last time, growth for growth's sake, because I think growth has a negative, can have a negative impact on both the community and of course it, it, it is, we're hitting ecological limits globally. So all of that needs to be considered and the externalities involved in particular economic sectors or particular employers. So I, I'm, I'm attuned to that. Um, this is a targeted sector for investment. It's been so for a long time. The site is targeted. Uh, in terms of development. Um, it is a ma major employer for the community. Um, I think that the local jobs or the local employment is quite favorable in terms of employing uh, local residents. Uh, obviously, Ivy Tech has been, been very responsive in terms of its training for this for local and regional uh, residents. Um, the range of skill sets, I think, is uh, very good. Uh, it doesn't just rely on a highly skilled in, in employees. Um, the uh, wage growth is very important for this, this community. Uh, we have a lot of service. We're, we're, we're high in service economy here. We're, we're, we're job rich, but wage poor. And so we really need to focus on the wage floor, as Councilmember Sandberg said. Um, last time. Uh, and I think that an average wage of $32 an hour is, is a real, uh, very uh, important thing to consider in, in terms of this uh, public investment. Um, I think we need to uh, think about the regional employment as well, where we are a regional employer. Um, we have a, a consequence for uh, residents of surrounding counties uh, not having adequate employ employment opportunities, um, and that affects negatively our community as well. Um, so on balance, I have more to say, but I, I don't want to take up any more time, but just to say that I think on balance, this is an appropriate use of, uh, of this abatement. And uh, I think that the returns on this investment for of Catalan have been significant. And so I expect, I will expect them to fulfill uh, or over fulfill as Councilmember Scamillary said last time, uh, their commitment. So uh, I'll be supporting this, thanks. Thank you. Additional public, uh, public, <laughs> additional council comment. And I see a hand up from Councilmember Flaherty. Thank you. Um, again, I appreciate all the work that's gone into this and the perspectives that have been shared from folks in the public, uh, my colleagues, uh, the folks presenting. Uh, first, I'll just note that uh, I agree with, with what many folks have said uh, from the administration, otherwise that Catalan pays good wages compared to our median income, of course, that that's very desirable to add jobs like these to Bloomington and that we would all welcome uh, the proposed expansion. Um, second, I'll note that I'm not principally opposed to tax abatements. They have a time and place and we have specific statutory guidance about when they're appropriate. 
but as I've kind of indicated in the past, uh, in our discussion of this, that's where I run into some trouble. The argument made by Catalan and by the administration has a logic that runs something like this. Catalan is a great employer and has exceeded our expectations. We want job growth and good wages. We're worried they may go somewhere else. Therefore, we should grant a $30 million tax abatement. But the problem is there's a pretty big inferential leap in the middle there that really hasn't been explained or justified. Best I can tell, no one has actually tried to explain why this abatement at that level is a necessary condition for Catalan's proposed investment saying they're a great employer, that we'd like more jobs, that pay well is not itself an explanation or justification. For all we know, even without the abatement, Bloomington represents the most attractive investment prospect among all alternatives. Uh, Mr. Crowley said that the hope is this abatement will tip the scales in favor of Catalan's expansion in Bloomington. But none of us knows whether anything is actually needed to tip the scale. It may already be tipped in our favor. Um, we don't know. We do know that Catalan would like to pay less taxes, but that's a truism and generally unhelpful here. We also know that Catalan's Bloomington site manager is in competition with site managers in other cities to win this expansion. Uh, and while that may be true, it really shouldn't factor into our decision making. The question we're answering is not whether some other community can give away enough by way of incentives to lure this expansion elsewhere. The question is, per Indiana code, if this site is undesirable for or impossible of normal development and occupancy and have conditions so impaired values as to prevent a normal development of property or use of property, because that's where tax abatements are appropriate. And again, it seems to me that no one has been able to answer this question affirmatively, at least, at least not with any level of specificity. Um, to do so, at least for me, Catalan would need to demonstrate that the proposed expansion could not occur but for this abatement. For instance, they could have showed that a there is a certain hurdle rate that Catalan's board needs to see in order to invest, and a sound financial model that demonstrates how without the abatement, the project would not clear that hurdle rate, and with the abatement, the project would clear the hurdle rate. Such a model, while not without limits, could also help demonstrate why 30 million. Maybe an abatement is justified here, but maybe only $20 million worth, maybe only $10 million worth. The broader point is, again, we don't know. None of us has any idea because no detailed case has been made as to why this proposed abatement at this level meets the statutory requirements. So that leaves all of us making decisions under a high degree of uncertainty based on certain assumptions we're all making. Uh, we come out on different sides of this question because of that uncertainty. Uh, if the proposed abatement is denied, I don't know whether expansion will proceed anyway. I really don't, none of us does. And that's a poor set of conditions to make a decision under. Um, and as such, I really can't in good conscience support a tax abatement when again, no one has really explained why it's a necessary condition to lead to the desired outcome. I'm not saying it's not necessary. I'm saying I don't know, and I need better information to make a sound decision to grant an abatement of this size. Uh, so I'll be voting no. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments from my colleagues. Councilmember Smith. Thank you. Uh, you all pretty much know my position that I think this is a great opportunity. Um, the tax abatement land landscape has really shifted and it's a lot different now. Um, and we are in a, com in a competition with other areas. This is just a win-win for everybody. This is a long-term, this is a long-term win for members of our community who will come after us. This is a long-term win for the future of Bloomington to have a uh, company of this size make another substantial investment in Bloomington. As uh, Ms. Uh, Kinari said, she wants her kids to be able to grow up here and uh, have a good job. And when so many companies have left different places manufacturing, this is an incredible opportunity. Um, over the course of 20 years, I'd like to point out the salaries uh, that will be paid to the 1,000 the thousand people who will either live here or in this re or will be in this region total about $134 million. The tax, the taxes the city will get if in one year, the city income tax is perhaps 455,000 by some estimates, if you, 
uh, extend that out over 20 years, it's over $9 million. Catalina is doing things to be a good community partner. They're environmentally sound. They're connecting the, their corporate business and the wages in their, in their business with Ivy Tech, with the local school systems. They have good values that we're seeing in their corporate groups. Um, you know, the question here is, if you vote against this, you're voting against bringing a thousand new jobs to Bloomington, and you're voting against bringing tens of millions of dollars into our local economy, along with the multiplier effect that, that Mr. Crowley talks about. It, it, the Envi uh, Economic Policy Institute says for every hundred jobs in pharmaceutical manufacturing, it will produce approximately 500 more jobs. Um, you know, I, I'm not uh, a statistician with that group, but it's, it's a very powerful argument um, to go along with the fact that it's just a, it seems like a no brainer to me and I'll be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, I see a hand from Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yeah, um, uh, this is not a no-brainer to me at all. This is a very difficult uh, decision. Um, I don't see it as a win-win. Uh, I, I see um, this whole process of tax abatements really is not a good way of running a local government in my view. Um, basically, so we're, you know, we have rules as a society that everybody pays taxes so that we can, um, uh, uh, do things as a community that we can't do as individuals. And then, um, uh, we basically say to a multi-billion dollar corporation that, no, you don't need to play by your rules. Uh, we're basically bribing, um, Catalan to expand here. Um, I mean, this is a corporation, uh, $3 billion of revenues in, um, 2020, the CEO makes $12.6 million. Um, the pay ratio is 189 to one for average pay, 318 to one for lowest pay, um, it's substantial. Um, and, uh, I also take to heart what, um, Joe Winia said about, uh, climate change and business as usual has gotten us to the point of, uh, threats to our biosphere and, uh, rapidly decreasing, uh, number of species that can survive and, um, a vastly different world, uh, projected um, for our children. And this is uh, business as usual in, in a bad business practice, which we are perpetuating. Um, now that said, uh, you know, if we were to uh, vote against this tax abatement, it's not gonna change anything. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, we, we, we are in the system that we find ourselves in. Um, it's uh, probably going to take, you know, near extinction to, to change it. Um, certainly uh, one vote here in Bloomington um, is not going to do the trick. Um, I definitely think that we need to look at our uh, economic development tools and use them for um, relocalization efforts, becoming more self-reliant as a community and not dependent on multinational corporations, um, especially in, in the food economy, as, as Councilmember Allo said, because in the future, we will have to 
uh, become more self-reliant as individuals and as, as communities around the world, um, just because of the, the vast negative uh, impacts of climate change that will already await us uh, in, in 30 years. Uh, um, even if we don't uh, change our, I mean, um, even if we do <laughs> change our ways uh, before then. So um, that's a lot of doom and gloom. Um, I guess in, in the current uh, paradigm, this, uh, this uh, does present a lot of good paying jobs and um, uh, Catalent has been a good community member. Um, they have uh, invested a lot in sustainability efforts. Um, they have done a lot of um, uh, DEI efforts uh, to increase diversity and make people feel like they're included and, and belong. And, um, you know, that's all good stuff. Uh, so, um, you know, I don't, I'm not crazy about it, but I'm going to vote yes. Thank you. Thank you. Next council member, council member Rosenberger. Thank you. Um, thank you to everyone for the conversation this week and at the last meeting. I have found found everything really helpful. Um, this was a really tough one for me and I really think the public comment tonight and emails and seriously just all the questions that were asked and answered and the updated PowerPoint has has been really good. I think I agree with um AirPod is saying. I think I agree with most of what people are saying tonight, which may has made it difficult for me to figure out. Um, and and I, I think, you know, as Councilmember Piemont Smith said, maybe the one thing I don't agree with is that this is a no brainer. I think, you know, we're elected to make tough decisions, and I think this is just another one of them in our timeline of all this. So where I'm coming from, my plan tonight is actually to abstain, which might seem kind of strange, but this is my reasoning behind it. Um, in general, I, don't, I do not support the tax abatement process, so it's very hard for me to get behind something that is a system that I don't agree with, and I think it, it just has to be something that is a no for me because it's a system that I, I think is broken and it's not going to get fixed until we really you know, look at, look at those systems. I think, I think um, it's just so difficult that we do these tax abatements for major corporations that I think actually in 2021 had $4 billion in revenue, but we have so many awesome small businesses in Bloomington that don't get tax abatements that, that provide really good paying jobs and have a good work-life balance, you know, good benefits. And I don't, I mean, I know we have small grants and things and we have, the economic development department but why don't we do you know anything for them that's that's kind of confusing to me that almost the bigger you are and the more money you make the, the more we give you and I, I i don't find that quite equitable in our city or i mean anywhere with this process so i don't support this process but on the other hand i think you know it catalan and the city are um right in using the process and the system that is available to them. I think that's kind of how rules work, policies work. And until it's changed, um, it, it would be silly, I think, for, for the city and, and, and Catalan not to try to take advantage of everything that is at their fingertips. So the idea for Catalan to you know, not go after a $30 million tax abatement, I, I can definitely understand that doesn't make financial sense. So. That like overarching, those are my two main reasons like to go to abstain because I think that Kylan is for them doing the right thing and it makes sense, but I do not believe in the system. So um, I I think I don't want to vote no and I don't want to vote yes and like just an abstention is, is really right. I think, <clears throat> sorry, it is hard for me sometimes that it feels like we have to convince a company to be in our city when we have a city that has so many people who want to live here. We don't have housing for them. So um, that doesn't mean they do have good jobs, but it, it means that like getting more people here is not part of our problem, I would say. Um, but also I think what Catalan does and the pay that they offer their lowest paid employees is also very awesome. And I worked for the AFL-CIO for a very long time. I'm a big fan of living wages. Um, 
And that that is very important to me. I think part of solving some of the housing crisis is making sure people can afford homes. Well, it's kind of mostly impossible with like the lowest paying job at Catalan, but it is still on the right track. I would say that's on the right track. Um, I think, you know, it's hard for me also to get behind the idea that someone, a company bringing in so many people, you know, mostly from the outside, the outside. So driving, using our roads, using our spaces, using our amenities does not pay their fair share in that process. I mean, most of us living here pay our fair share. And I think that is really important, important. And that's just another case that this doesn't feel equitable to me. Um, I think there's been a lot of discussion tonight, especially in public comment and some of the of, of your all's um, final comments that it kind of feels like an either or. It's like either you can be for the climate and vote no on this, or you can be for business and vote yes on this. And I think this was a missed opportunity to be an and instead. And, um, you know, you can have, we've had many PUDs come in that have paid for a bus route to their um, their new apartment building or added bus buses to a route already in existence. And we talked about that last time and that was not mentioned here as something that um, was on the table. So I just think the lack of um, willing to negotiate is a turn off for me. And also just that this was a missed opportunity to do something that could be climate friendly and and help reach uh, goals in our climate action plan that to me are very real. Um, I just don't think it had to be that either or. Um, so that's, I think, most of my reasoning that I have scribbled out here. I just want to end by saying I really genuinely appreciate this process that we went through. I learned a lot from everyone presenting and my colleagues in the public. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next council comment. Not seeing any hand. Oh, council member Volan. Uh, many of the arguments I've heard for this abate, the largest abatement proposed in city history are very spongy. They're loose, they've got holes in them, they're devoid of details. I don't know if sponges are, un, are particularly undetailed, but I'm going with my analogy. Uh, for one thing, this labor market is already attractive. It's because of the investments that prior mayors and prior councils have made, not in tax abatements, but in everything else, sidewalks, street redesigns, rescuing restaurants during the pandemic, the B line, the seven line, switchyard park, all the affordable housing that this administration has been so rightly proud of getting built, all that makes a desirable community. Even during downturns, Bloomington has been a good steward of its budgets so that it can afford to make those improvements. We've never had a budget crisis locally, not compared to some other cities just in this state alone, even during the Great Recession, because we always kept a healthy rainy day fund and we paid attention to our budget. And that's praise that goes to every uh, administration and council before now, including ours. I've heard this argument every time, why would a public official even hesitate? But then we ask for hard numbers and they never seem to be handy. The representatives from Catalan understandably don't want to have to be held to any obligation more than they have to. That's just business. But we as a city didn't even make an effort to by that modest amount of information, like uh, what percentage of their applicants uh, came from outside the county, by requiring it as a condition of the abatement, that's something we could have done. Very modest, not a big stretch for a large corporation. They have an HR department. Despite the many reasons to be skeptical of the claims for the need for this abatement, I would have been willing to vote for this if Catalan had done something infrastructure-wise for the city besides buying a lot of equipment to do their business. As I asked two weeks ago, they could have committed to doing something that furthers our comprehensive plan. And that would have furthered their bottom line. They could have built housing on their surface parking. They would have reduced commute times for many employees. They would have brought more density. 
to the city. They would have reduced the demand for vehicles to be used in the first place. They would have increased the demand for public transit and made it more viable here in Bloomington. And they could have made money in the process, either leasing the land or building the housing themselves. They still can do all of this, and we'll see if they do. But the company claims its hands are tied. Again, they didn't send us representatives that could make such a decision on the spot. And meanwhile, we're being asked basically to bid blindly on their business, along with many other communities. Okay, so this is what we're doing. Fine. Uh, we already have a have and have not environment, if we're worried about that. We can see it in the housing market. The very housing, which many of my colleagues fought so hard to protect, the single family housing that they think is the only good kind of housing, is not being built here anymore. We've demonstrated that in previous meetings before this resolution. Single family housing is too expensive to build anymore. Even multifamily housing is too expensive. And there's not enough being built that can be owned by its occupants. There's an anti-density movement among some county government officials. They too are actively rejecting density in multifamily housing, which would be better for the environment, for public transit, and for housing, all the new jobs that are probably going to come more than the thousand that Catalan plans to hire, because the, they and Cook Pharma in the past have demonstrated that they are growing immensely. The local economy is indeed a complicated and interdependent whole, said Mr. Crowley. But Catalan has disclosed that 48% of their current employees don't live in our jurisdiction. And we don't know what portion of that 52% who do live in Monroe County live in the city. But let's make an assumption. We have 58, 59% of the population of the county. Uh, if we multiply that by the 52% of employees at Catalan who live in Monroe County, that means that 30 to 31% of Catalan employees live in the city of Bloomington proper. Less than a third of their employees are living in. Bloomington, give or take a couple of percent. The supporters of this project tend to speak in generalities. This would be good for the community, the area. People love to talk about Greater Bloomington. It's in the name of the Chamber of Commerce. All of us working together as a team. But it appears that the 30% of people in this community that are in Bloomington proper are the ones expected to pick up the tab for the whole table. Ultimately, the only hard number that they needed to get most people's vote is their actual employee count. I and mean, that's hard to dispute. Catalent and Cook Pharmaca before it brought thousands of jobs to the community that simply weren't there, weren't forthcoming before. As positive as that is, I echo Councilmember Flaherty's observations about how little other information we have to make a truly informed decision and thus the sponginess of the argument for this abatement. I can't vote in good conscience for this abatement partly because the entire concept of tax abatements is problematic, and partly because uh, Catalan couldn't do the one thing that I asked in the short amount of time that they had. That's an issue with the tax abatement process itself and how little uh, opportunity there is for council members to really get ideas like this uh, in the discussion before the, the documents have been drawn up. But because I hope that Catalan will actually get our data we asked for, and perhaps to build housing on their surface parking, that I'm unwilling to vote against it. Therefore, I'm going to be abstaining as a show of good faith to Catalan. And I would also ask the administration to stop relying on abatements and to start by making this their last such request to us. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments from council. Council Member Scambolori. Yes, thank you. And thank you everyone truly for the excellent questions. Um, and just for the active and thoughtful discussion as Council Member Rosenberger said, I've learned a lot during this process too. Um, so here's my thinking. As council members, we have a range of responsibilities, fiscal and otherwise. From my perspective, I feel like one of my greatest responsibilities while I'm in office is to do everything I can to help ensure Bloomington's long-term resilience, and particularly its economic resilience. It's often been observed that Bloomington is an ambitious city, and we are. 
We've placed a priority on combating the effects of climate change and enhancing our infrastructure and assisting and supporting our most vulnerable citizens and more. Only an economically healthy city has the capacity to do all those things to which we aspire. Are we an inherently attractive community in which to locate and grow a business? I think so. But I think we're deeply mistaken if we assume we're the only one. Are there some gaps in the information we're using to make this decision this evening? Yes. We don't know the details and nuances of what's available or what's being promised by communities in Maryland or Wisconsin or Missouri, nor are we likely to. Could the land in question ever be developed absent something like this abasement? The most I seem to be hearing tonight is possibly. And so, like most of the big decisions we make, we will each cast our vote tonight based on incomplete information. Based on what I've heard from Catalan, from colleagues in economic and sustainable development, from the BDC, from the local employer community, and many others, I believe Catalan's proposed project is an enviable opportunity for Bloomington. As I observed in one of our February meetings, Catalan has a history of under-promising and over-delivering. They have invested significant dollars in enhancing this community, and they have exceeded expectations in job creation. They offer higher than average wages with their diversified offerings in one of the more downturn resistant life science, in the most downturn resistant life sciences industry. And I am also encouraged precisely because Catalan isn't doing business the way we have for the last century and because they represent a departure from smokestack industries that we heard about in public comment and that I grew up near in Gary. Bloomington benefits, and to put a finer point on that, Bloomington residents, individuals and families who can take on these jobs benefit when we secure the right kind of investment by the right kind of employer at the right time. And I think Catalan has proposed just such a project. And I believe we have some guardrails in place that will help ensure a positive return. And because of that, I appreciate Catalan's consideration of Bloomington for their expansion. And I'm very pleased to offer my enthusiastic support for this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments from Council. Council Member Sims. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I will be supporting this legislation this evening. Um, I am very happy to have heard all the conversation discussion we've had this evening. Um, much of it I agree with. Um, much of it I can, you know, I'm not so sure how relevant it is. Um, and I've already stated that I will support this. We're talking, there are a lot of good points um, from climate change um, and action and resilience um, from, from some of those um, issues. I've heard about diversification um, or the lack thereof. And if one company leaves the town, then there will be this big void and, and and the, all that is true, but I think we need to look around us um, and look at our strong and improving tourism market, the avenues we're making in technology. Um, I have noticed, I think it's probably four or five new restaurants that will be relocating here or locating here that is a part of already our restaurant mix. Um, I listened to an Indiana University economist at a meeting the other day. Um, Indiana University being a flagship um, campus increased by a certain percentage. And if I'm not mistaken, I think other campuses or uh, colleges across the, country, uh, the state, including Ball State and Indian, Indiana State, have lost enrollment. And I think all that's concerned is because we're gonna have smaller graduating classes from high school, um, not only in the state, but across the nation. So something else that's concerning um, that we need to take into account. Um, I need to mention Indiana University and IU Health as part of that diversification and all of our local businesses. We never ever want to um, not give them credit for what they do. It is very tough market for our local businesses and I think we do a lot to try to sustain them and um, hopefully we can get many, many more. 
there was some mention of uh, some uh, most vulnerable populations, I think is what I heard. Um, I think um, I could be considered part of one of those vulnerable populations, um, even though I'm blessed to have you know, worked for a lot of years at the university and retired and that sort of thing. However, I go to church every week with people that are looking for well-paying jobs, and many of them work at or starting to go to Catlin and have worked at Cook. Um, many of them work at lower paying restaurant jobs. Okay, I am part of that. I am part of this community that people who come to our food pantry to get the food that we give and help our community members, those most vulnerable population demographics. I think Catalan is, 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 yes, we, we could talk either way. Um, there are some good things, there are some bad things, or not as good things. I don't want to say bad things. Um, but I heard a lot of good things. I really like their DEI initiatives and how we uh, are trying to offer a sense of belonging by meeting people where, where they are and helping that growth. Um, and I think that is something that is attractive to many of the populations that were. Um, that we're talking about this evening throughout, even if it is the 52% of those that are in this county. Um, I find that very interesting too, because like I said, I worked at Indiana University for 30 some years, and many of my entry level employees could not afford to live in this county. I've mentioned this before, many of them lived outside of this county and drove in every day. I don't see a whole lot of difference um, with other employers and one of the issues that I think we've not really talked about is the labor pool itself. I mean, if we had the labor pool, then you can get 85% of them from the county. It's just not the case. Um, housing, um, I'm of a mind of the supply and demand, and I know there's many other factors. And with the housing study and, and the goals we're trying to make, I think by 2050, uh, I do believe was the date, what I do believe is supply and demand, that we need more supply, and I think we're getting there. We're a long way from there, but I think we're getting there. And I am wondering how in the future, how is that going to affect the demand? Um, how does it affect the housing costs? Will it begin to level off and stabilize? Will it's possible that it even decreases? Um, I'm not so sure, but those are things that we really need to look forward to and look at. And the last thing, um, that I will say, and I hope no one takes offense to this, I just uh, found it pretty disagreeable. Um, and I know there'll be some other things said, but I found it pretty disagreeable that we would dare ask Catalan to provide the addresses of their employees. We don't do that for Indiana University. We don't do that for IU Health. We don't do that. I mean, I don't, I don't understand it. We didn't do it before in previous abatements that we've talked about. I'm not so sure what we hope to gain from that information. They already said 52% here, 48% out. Um, I, I don't think it makes a difference whether it's in city or county property. This is a regional situation, regional center, regional employment, regional um, markets, regional arts. That's what we are. So I, I tend to not see the relevance of, of that, um, even though I can respect it. Um, but I also want to thank um, uh, Mr. Espejo and all those folks from Catalan and um, Mr. Crowley um, for this lively discussion and, and my colleagues. Um, I too learned a lot. Um, and I will agree, this is definitely not a no brainer. <laughs> this is definitely not that. And. Um, and thank you. I will be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you. It appears that I will be the last to make a comment here, unless there's someone else who wants to jump on after we've all had a chance. Um, I will repeat what I said last, last time when we were discussing this, that wages are very much a part of affordability and the puzzle that we're all trying to put together with respect to how do we build the city where people can afford to live here and can afford to live here comfortably and raise their families here. 
and pay for their educations here. And, and one of the secrets is raising the wage floor. It has been traditionally low here in the city of Bloomington. We're a wonderful community with much to offer with respects to our culture, our arts, our amenities. Um, many people come to school here and stay here because Bloomington is really a unique and an enjoyable place to live, but it, it is not by any stretch of the imagination all that it can be. And I know there is not a single member of this council that doesn't want to leave the city of Bloomington better than we found it when we began our public service. When we go back, those of us that have lived here for a long time, resilience is a wonderful word because when the manufacturing sector did start to leave and jobs were, were sent to Mexico, um, our, our community was in trouble with respect to people being able to afford to, to pay for what they needed to pay for to raise their families. We struggled mightily. And now we have an opportunity before us. It's a remarkable opportunity to increase that wage floor to a point that it will have a, a, a domino effect on other employers in this community. And uh, I believe that it's an opportunity that we must take advantage of. And so obviously my support is for this. Um, I want to thank all of my friends and constituents who helped think this through for me. Um, it is a tough decision. All of our decisions are difficult that we've been grappling with, with respect to housing and housing costs and, and who profits and who, who loses. Um, these are never easy decisions, but this is a decision that I am making this evening from my heart, from loving this community, seeing the struggles that we've faced in this community and seeing this opportunity in front of us that I feel very strongly that we must take. Um, so again, thanks to everyone who has uh, expressed their opinion and been so articulate about uh, why you've come to the decision that you're coming to tonight, but my vote is a very strong yes. And with that, uh, are there additional comments anyone would like to make? I see a hand up from Council Member Bowen. Yes, I wanted to address Mr. Sims's point, he accused me of wanting to somehow invade the privacy of employees. I didn't ask for address. Madam, Madam Chair, I yes. did not accuse anyone of anyone, I just, of anything. I just made a comment, uh, just, uh, just for my own personal feelings. I just wanted to make that statement. Thank, thank you. you for that clarification. I will rem remind everyone to just keep to the issue as to why you support or not, and try not to bring any personalities into this. Thank you. I am not bringing personalities into it, Madam Chair. I am simply pointing out that Mr. Sims made a rhetorical point, and an ac you should not take the word accusation personally. We can discuss that another time. He said somehow I wanted to invade the privacy of employees. I didn't ask for addresses. I asked simply for what county they live in or whether they live within the city. Catalent already provided the origin of their employees, whether they're in county or out. So I don't appreciate the implication that somehow I'm trying to invade someone's privacy. And meanwhile, IU is not asking us for a $30 million tax break. That he would be put off by such a trivial request illustrates the problem with proponents' lack of detail, lack of interest in detail on these questions. I'd like to close with one point that's a general point. If the proportions we've discussed tonight are correct and they stay the same, 30% of new jobs at Catalan are being made available to Bloomington residents and taxpayers, as in 30% of them uh, of the people who take those jobs will be living in the city limits of Bloomington, only 30%. 48% are going outside the county, and the other 22% of new jobs at Catalan and 22% of existing jobs there are gonna be going to people, a significant portion of whom are remonstrating against becoming part of the very city that is making this generous abatement offer. I think it's more important to look into the details than some proponents of this proposal would like to pretend. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if there are no additional comments, I see a hand up from Council Member Flaherty. Thank you. Yes, just a brief follow up. Um, I appreciate the folks can come out on either side of this proposed abatement, and that's great. But my colleague from District 3 said, if you vote against this, you're voting against bringing a thousand good jobs to Bloomington. And I just wanted to note that that statement is, of course, patently false. 
We're not voting on whether or not to bring jobs. We're voting on a $30 million tax abatement for a highly profitable corporation as an incentive to bring jobs. Whether or not that incentive is needed and whether or not the jobs would come here without the abatement is anyone's guess. Thank you. Thank you. And if there are no further comments at this time, I believe we are ready to ask the clerk to call the roll on resolution 22-06. Council Member Smith? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Rosenbarger? Abstain. Sims? Yes. Volan? Abstain. Scambaluri? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. And Flaherty? No. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And that passes 6 1 2. And that concludes our legislation for second reading this evening. We have no legislation for first reading which brings us to an additional opportunity for public comment this evening on matters not on tonight's agenda. And so if anyone here from the public would like to raise their hand to make a comment about something we've not discussed tonight, now would be your opportunity to do so. And I will ask Mr. Lucas if he sees any hands up or anything in the chat that I am not seeing. I don't see any uh, comments at the moment. Then let us move on to a discussion of our council schedule. Yes, thank you. Uh, just a couple of uh, items. Um, as uh, President Sandberg just noted, uh, tonight's meeting had no legislation for first reading, uh, which means there will be no items of business uh, for the council to consider next week at its scheduled committee meeting. So uh, it would be appropriate for the council to consider a motion to cancel uh, the March 9th meeting. So moved. Second. second. Moved and seconded. And will the clerk, does the clerk need to call the roll on that? I believe she does. Yes. Sorry about that. I wasn't quite ready. Uh, Council Member Piedmont Smith? Yes. Rosenberger? Yes. Sims? Yes. Volan? Yes. Gambalori? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. And Smith? Yes. Thank you. There will be no committee of the whole on March the 9th. Are there additional matters we need to talk about? Yes, just a reminder that the uh, council has no scheduled meeting on March 16th, uh, which is the uh, spring break for both IU and uh, MCCSC. So the council is next scheduled to meet uh, for its regular session on March 23rd. And there will be items uh, ready for council action at that meeting that you can hear about this Friday at the council scheduled work session. And those items would include a resolution uh, regarding the uh, opioid settlement that you all uh, considered last, last year to opt out of a class action uh, settlement suit. Uh, there has been uh, some recent developments and the administration is planning to bring a resolution uh, for the city to opt back into that settlement. So uh, that is one item you can hear about this Friday. Uh, the other item is a right of way vacation uh, for the uh, Hopewell uh, site. Um, at the old hospital site uh, that will be ready for introduction March 23rd. So um, unless there uh, will not be enough council members to hold the work session this Friday, we will plan on uh, continuing with that. So perhaps by a show of hands, you could 
let me know if you plan to attend or are able to attend the work session this Friday. Yes, how many people can be with us on Friday? All right, I see a fair number of hands. So thank you very much. Those should be interesting topics. And those are the items I've got tonight for council scheduling. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lucas. And with that, we have concluded our business for this evening. So could I have a motion for adjournment? Madam Chair? Yes, ma Quick question. Can yes. we find out, do we have any sense of whether the governor is going to lift the uh, remote meeting order? That's a good question. I don't know if Mr. Lucas has any guidance on that. We will know by Friday for sure. Um, we, we have heard from some folks at the state that he may extend it a bit further, but I, they weren't sure. Um, so it's possible he'll extend it another 30 days. It's possible uh, if he extends it uh, beyond this Friday, it may be for a shorter period of time. I know uh, publicly he stated that uh, his ability to end the public health uh, emergency declaration hinged on the state legislature uh, taking action to make sure the state was still eligible for funding from the federal government. So um, we will know one way or the other by this Friday, and uh, we'll certainly pass along any information when we get that. Very good. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And with that, if there's no further business, motion to adjourn from someone? So moved. Second. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your attention this evening. We are adjourned.